Join WWE Hall of Famer Tony Atlas live Friday, August the 31st at MWF Studios in Norris, Massachusetts for a new Memories and Legends television taping. Hundreds of thousands of fans from around the world have enjoyed Tony's shoots, and we want you to join the fun live. Admission to the taping is absolutely free, but at the same time, we need fan support to make these productions happen. Visit BostonWrestling.com and use the link below to explore the Indiegogo campaign we have going on to fund these expensive productions to help bring Tony's story to life for fans to enjoy for decades to come. Fans, hear from the horse's mouth itself why it's important. Memories and Legends continues. I tell you, we love to do these productions. I think if we're able to ever get to a certain point, with the assistance of the fans. Tony, I'm sure you'd be happy to come down every week if we could make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yes, I would. And I, first, I would like to thank you, Dan, and Boston Wrestling, because one thing that a, a lot of uh, fans uh, seem to forget, uh, we ain't going to be around forever. I mean, when I look back on guys that I sat and, and, and talked to just last year alone, I mean, just about every year, we lose two or three wrestlers, oh, Vader, yep. Ronnie Piper, you know, uh, in, in 2010, I lost at my best friend, S.D. Jones. So there's very few men, our uh, Brutus the Bob Beefcake, were talking uh, 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 two weeks ago. And we're always so happy to see each other because they very few of us is left. You know, I, it just seemed like yesterday that I was in Legend House, WWE Legend House, with uh, uh, Rotten and Ronnie Piper. And now Piper is not around anymore to tell his story. He's not around anymore to sign autograph. He's not around anymore to... Uh, 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 meet and greet the fan. So thanks to the good work of uh, Boston Wrestling and uh, uh, Dan Morella here, you know, you're able to see, you know, us, you know, uh, and, and it would not be possible. I mean, Tony Atlas would be probably forgotten about if it wasn't for uh, Boston Wrestling. I don't know so, if I'd go that far, Tony. Well, you're a two-time you know, Hall out of, of sight, out of man. Right. I mean, I, the, people are able to, 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 to tune in to, to Boston Wrestling. They're able to hear some of the old stories that, that a lot of the guys, like some of the stories I tell, the rest of the day, uh, they was babies. Just like uh, 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 Roma Rage, you know, his right. father and, and me, wrestled Seeker. his father, yep. yeah. Seeker. Yeah, his Seeker, uh, uh, one of the Wild Samoan Seekers, was traveling up and down the road with us and, and, and uh, way before uh, uh, Roma Rage was even born. You know, and like The Rock, you know, I, I used to sit in the dressing room and babysit Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, with me and his father, you know, we was on tour of the gutters. The, 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 he was, I remember he was a kid. But, you know, a lot of us, like me, Rock and Johnson, you know, we get up in age. So it makes us feel good that we could come to a, a, a program like this where people can hear about the way wrestling were uh, back in our day. Kind of like if you get out here, the Rolling Stones to sit here to tell uh, uh, music fans how it was to travel in the days of, uh, of when the Rolling Stones first started their career and when they first uh, did things. So it, it's a great uh, history lesson of, 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 of pro wrestling and, and athlete. So once again, thank you, Dan, and thank you, Boston Wrestling, for giving us the hot opportunity to tell our stories. Tony will also be available for autographs and pose photos the night of the taping for a moderate fee. Time permitting, we're looking to have a Q&A with the fans. No purchase required. We really want you to come out and enjoy yourself on our ongoing efforts to give fans the best value and experience in professional wrestling. At the same time, your support goes a long way in helping memories and legends continue for years to come. Wrestling fans, I'm Dan Marotti. And I'm Tony, Mr. USA Atlas. How y'all doing out there? Before we get to the news, some topics of discussion, check out some offers from our great friends. We'll be right back. Are you part of a nonprofit organization, a youth group looking to raise cash for your cause? Stay tuned at the end of this video to learn how you can bring the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation to your town live, featuring the superstars and legends of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Have you ever thought about just how much time it takes to plan every detail of your wedding day? Many brides are now spending 10 to 15 hours each week planning the perfect day. It's like adding a part-time job to your already busy life. Not everyone can afford to hire a full-time wedding planner to help with every detail, which is why so many brides are now turning to a wedding day coordinator. That's right, a wedding day coordinator saves you money, and more importantly, it gives you the peace of mind that your special day will run smoothly. From finalizing all of the details you've worked so hard on to coordinating with vendors, KL Wedding Coordinators will be there every step of the way to guide you through the day and allow you to savor the memories that'll last a lifetime. For more information, visit facebook.com backslash KL Wedding Coordinators or give them a call, 
320-2752. They're ready. Ready to take their rightful place amongst the literary greats. Who, 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 who? Who, you ask? The New Day! That's who. It's the Book of Booty. Shake it, love it, never be it. It's the feel-good story of the rise of the New Day. Loaded with games, trivia, coloring pages, and so much more. The Book of Booty. Shake it, love it, never be it. Available now, online, or wherever books are sold. This is Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there, live. Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, welcome to a special edition of Memories and Legends. I'm Dan Marotti, joined by my good friend, WWE 2006 Hall of Famer, Tony, Mr. USA Atlas. I was going to remind them you're a two-time Hall of Famer. Bodybuilding Hall of Famer, too. Now, there are a lot of fans that nowadays don't know that you were a bodybuilding Hall of Fame. When That's did you go into bodybuilding that? Bodybuilding 2007, bodybuilding is not on television. Well, it's quite an accomplishment for you. I, yeah. I don't know too many bodybuilding Hall of Famers. Yeah. I know plenty of WWE ones. Yeah. What did you do to get into the bodybuilding Hall of Fame for those? That you had to know? win a lot of titles. Yeah. And did you? Yeah, I won about two or three hundred. Was that before or after professional wrestling? During wrestling. During wrestling. Yeah, because before I couldn't afford to go, and the wrestling paid my way. Through, uh, paid for my bodybuilding career. Now, what years were this at your peak in bodybuilding? Uh, I started as an amateur back in the late 60s, and I competed all the way up in bodybuilding up to 1985. And I won the uh, AAU Mr. Universe in 85. Then I switched uh, over and just stayed with powerlifting, and I, and I competed in powerlifting all the way up until uh, 1999. Wow, really? That late? 1999? Yep, yep. I set uh, at, at age 50. I set the main state bench press rack of 575, and nobody broke it. Wow. Did you enjoy either one more than the other? Did you enjoy wrestling more than bodybuilding? Did you enjoy bodybuilding Well, people more? ask me that, which one I like best, uh, uh, bodybuilding and uh, uh, working out or wrestling. They have to pay me to wrestle. I pay to bodybuild. So, I mean, I guess you can decipher the answer out of that then. Yeah. All right. Well, because, you... because in, 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 in bodybuilding, I set my own destiny. It was, it was, I was the captain of my own ship. I, uh, it was up to me whether I win or lose. It was up to me if I fail or succeed. In wrestling, I had no control of what happened with my career. Was there any decent money for professional bodybuilders back then? Was there enough for you to leave wrestling? Could you have made a good living? Yeah, if you had to get a sponsors, endorsements, and, and uh, uh, stuff of that nature, but it's not a regular, uh, a regular thing. Like for example, everybody's not into fitness. Just like right now, if you read statistics, uh, thirty percent, thirty percent of teenagers is already diabetic. Really? So, yeah. So, so fitness in Europe, fitness is very uh, prominent. You know, you don't see uh, the medical problem that in Europe that you see in America. We are, uh, we, we don't like to be in shape. We're more comfortable being out of shape. I, I go to Kosovo once a year, and every, every time I go over there, they always tell me the same thing. Every year, they have to lower the standards for, in order to get people into the service. Because most of the kids coming to the military now, they're so badly out of shape and that they can't pass the physical. Wow. Now, you take 
like uh, that gentleman here, when he was in the Marine Corps, you had to be a tough person. But the way kids are raised now, they, their parents give them what they call choices. Mm -hmm. What you want to eat? Do you want this? And the, and the child is able to choose what he do or don't want to do. In the military, you don't have no choices. They don't right. ask yep. you to march. They tell you to march. They don't ask you to get up, uh, get out of bed. They tell you to get out of bed. And the, the newer generation is not used to being told what to do. They used to being asked what to do. It's a difference between somebody telling you to do something and somebody asking you. Plus, a lot of the people that have grown up now and they're not, uh, they're not used to being around talking to people like me and you talk. Let my daughter, I call her, I call her, I call her. She won't pick up the phone. So I get real nervous. I say, I hope nothing happened to her, you know, because I keep calling this woman and she won't pick up the phone. What in the world is wrong? You know, is there something wrong with my grandkids? Is there something wrong? The house burned out? I don't know. So I text her. Are you okay? She texts me back this quick. So the only way I could, you can communicate with a person is through texting. People don't talk anymore. It's a different world, that's for sure, when it comes well, to the world of communication, absolutely. Well, they're addicted to the cell phone. And a lot of The cell phone, the younger generation, is the most important thing in their life. Name one thing that a person could do today without the cell phone being involved. They can't drive and do it. They can't eat and do it. They can't work out and do it. There's not one thing the new generation could do without the presence of that cell phone. Not one thing. Well, I know you see a lot of that, Tony. I'm sure a lot of fans maybe don't know. A great segue from your bodybuilding hall of fame. Now up in Maine, you're a certified personal trainer. In yes, I, I, I train people, and that's one of the hard things that I had was to get them to stay off the phone long enough to work out. They can't do it. Do you have clients that you have to kind of yes, push? I really? Do it every day. Every day, a guy lay down and do ten reps, and as soon as he get through doing a set. While he's paying you to be his yes, trainer. Yes, really? Yes. Wow. I seen a woman one time scare me to death. I'm, going, I'm coming down the highway, going about 45 miles per hour. Luckily, I had my wife with me. She said, watch out for her. I said, she's on the sidewalk. She's not going to walk out in the street. She was pushing a baby in a carriage. Mm -hmm. and I'm sure a lot of y'all have seen this, pushing a baby in a carriage. A little infant. Probably about well, a, most of them are little when they're yeah, in a the carriage. Yeah, in a carriage. She's pushing, and she's holding this phone, and she's looking on at the phone. And she keep walking, keep walking. She comes right out in the street. Everybody slamming on their brake. She keep going. I blow my horn at her. She never looked up. She stayed looking at the phone. Got right across on the other side. Never looked up once. Didn't look up at all. Never looked up oh. once. What is it like for the lovely Mrs. Atlas to have such a wildly unique husband, a man that still competes in the world of professional wrestling amongst his other various personal appearances, a man that's busy in the community, personal training, I know you're involved in a lot of civic activities with kids up in Maine. Uh, a unique world for her to get into. She's not your first wife. Um, I believe the longest lasting. If you told my wife all that you just said, she would ask you, who the hell are you talking about? What do you mean? Well, wives don't see the husband the way other people do. Mm -hmm. I'm, I told my wife one time, I said, look, I'm the boss. She said, okay, take the garbage out. I said, wait, wait a minute, if I'm the boss, I suppose, she said, look, I put you in charge of the garbage, you want more duties? <laughs> I told her one time that I was the, the head of the family, she said, yeah, but I'm the neck to turn the head. See, I learned one thing from being married to my wife. She's always right, and I'm always wrong. You get along better that way. That's one thing I remember from uh, mine, but that's a different story for a different I'm, time. I, if, if my wife do something right now, I'm here in Mass. My wife is in Maine. It's my fault. You never really I made her do it because she was thinking about me and she messed up. You didn't bring her around the wrestling no. all that much. I remember her once down the street at a Tony Rumble event. She came with you down to at yeah. Memorial Hall. Wait, but she comes when it, like, if it's close by yeah. and I don't have a whole lot to do. And she's able to, I'm able to spend time with her to do other things, you know. She likes to go to places like when you go down on the shore, on mm -hmm. the beach, you know, Cape Cobb and stuff like that, uh, Plummer. She liked that because with Plummer, I took her there for a show, and she was able to go out and take pictures of the old ships and, you know, do a little sights. She likes to go places where there's a lot of sights. She's really into photography. You know, she loved photography, so she liked to go around taking uh, 
pictures of different things. She was born in uh, Berlin, Germany in 1941. Wow. And so she liked picture taking, you know, old fashioned woman. Yeah, old fashioned. You really lucked into meeting that one. I know from your outstanding autobiography that's available now online. Was she the first you woman? You had some interesting female relations over the years. I met, I met three women in my whole life that really cared about me. Mm -hmm. My mother, my grandmother, Orella, and uh, my wife now. But the strange thing about it, I couldn't find not one woman in America that liked me. I found thousands of women that liked Tony Atlas, but not one that liked me. I had to go all the way to Germany to find a woman that cared about me. You met her in Germany? Well, I, I met her before, but then when she came here, we, we hooked up. I didn't really know her, but she said she met me b before. There. Oh, so maybe like almost like a fan experience well, overseas she, No, or she didn't like even that? know nothing about Rashi. She just seen me going down the street. She said she'd never seen anything look like that. She met you when you were on a tour? Yeah, yeah. Really? she saw me when I was on tour. And she then said, reconnected? Yeah, she said she never saw a man like that. Because wow. in Germany, there's, no, there's not many, there wasn't many blacks, you know? Yeah. So when she saw a black guy walking down the street with 22-inch arm and a 28-inch waist, I mean, it caught her attention. Apparently, yeah. if she remembered yeah. you decades later yeah, up in Maine. because she said she never saw a man built like that before. It's almost like something out of a Hollywood movie. Yeah, she said something on the cover of magazines and stuff. So she, had, she saw me before, but I never saw her until I went to Maine. But when, she had, when you reconnected, how long did it take for her to realize you were the same guy? When Vince McMahon called me back to do Sapa Simba. So you were with her mm -hmm. actively. She didn't know who I was. And she didn't realize that you were no the same idea. people until, I'm going to guess, a couple months after the I got a phone call from Vince McMahon. He wanted me to come back to do a character called Saba Simba, where I dressed up like this Africa. And that's when she realized that I was arrested. That we, we, was, we was married for about a year before she knew I even arrested. You were out of competition at that point? Yep. Now, why yep. was that? Well, I wasn't out of competition. I, I, I didn't finish. I was out of bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. I was just doing powerlifting. But no she, wrestling? No, well, yeah, I was blackballed. Okay. WWE, uh, where WWF that time, they blackballed me. Well, what is the magic that has made this marriage, unlike some of the other ones, last so long and still very happy based on... She the... fell in love with the person, not the image. Rest, rest they fall in love with the image. Like, I, I hear people say, oh, I would just love to meet The Rock. When The Rock was not famous, he still was good looking. He was better looking then than what he is now. But the women didn't chase him then. They didn't start chasing him, they got famous. Really? Now they love him. He's famous. But when he wasn't famous, I, we used to, he used to go to match with me, him and his dad. You know, I didn't see no women chasing him then. But as soon as he walked on that TV, I had to fight him off with a stick. Well, he said when he was done with... See, it's hard, it's hard for celebrities to find what you call true love. Because the image of the person is so strong that, that when people come towards them, they're more infatuated by the image more so than they are with the person himself. Then when they get to know the real person, they feel kind of disappointed. They find out he put his clothes on the same way you do. When he leaves the bathroom, it smells the same way it did when you left it. He eats the same way you eat. You know, and then all of a sudden all this, whatever you had in your mind about this certain person, all come crashing down and you find out that he that celebrities are just as human and just as much a person as, uh, as you are. So I, I, I've never been a person that chases celebrities, so I wouldn't know exactly how they feel. But I do know on this end of the, of the spectrum, they expect a lot more out of it than what they get. One, one thing of being married to a celebrity or a wrestler, for example, is a, is a lonely life for wives. Sure is very lonely life uh, uh, for a while. You can't take your wife everywhere you go. Just like, just like the guys with the WWE now. If you're on Monday Night Raw, they leave their house on Friday. They don't come back home until Tuesday. They fly home Tuesday morning because yep. they do Monday Night Raw. Right. So they fly home Tuesday morning. So they home Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Then they're gone again. Gone again. Gone again. Now, SmackDown... They leave their house on Saturday and fly home on Wednesday right. because they do SmackDown on Tuesday night. Right. So right after SmackDown, the Raw is, is, is the last booking. 
So they're on the road four days a week. Now, in my day, we got off, we worked 355 days a year. So if you were married to me back in the 70s, you saw me 10 days a year. But in the territories, a lot of those were yeah, trips you, you, you had could to go bring home your, the But when you night. move from one territory, like you be in Mid-Atlantic, which is North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, but then you're there for two years, and then your, your time is up there. So what they would do now, they would send you to another territory. Your wife and kids, had to, you had to pull your kid out of school, pack up your house, and take them with you. But the boys was on the road even though you were in territory. Like in Charlotte, with the territory, the boys used to leave their house on a Tuesday because we did Charlotte on Monday. Tuesday we did Raleigh, North Carolina. Wednesday we stayed we stay over in Raleigh. We did we did TV taping on uh on, on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Thursday you even went to to uh uh Norfolk, Virginia, or you went to Charleston, South Carolina, not Charleston, but uh, 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 Columbus, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. If you're on one, the A team or the B team, or you went to Richmond, and or went to Charleston, South Carolina, or you went to uh, uh, Roanoke on Saturday, or went to Spottenboro on, on Saturday, and you was home Sunday. So even then, if your wife was living with you, she saw you on, on uh, Sunday, and Monday, and a half a day Tuesday. Wow. So it's always been, it's like you take an actor, for example. When they go on, they go on set to make a movie, they could be gone three, two to three months. You take a, a, a musician, when he goes on the road, like Michael Jackson, Prince, and all them guys, when they go on the road, uh, they, they could be gone for a couple of months on the road. So the wife is, you know, she can't just, like Ronnie Piper's wife, you know, she very rarely you know, travel with him. Mm -hmm. Huck Hogan wife very rarely travel uh, uh, with him. They can't. They, they, you know, they, they, the promotion is not going to pay for them to come along. Right. Absolutely. So the rest right. himself had to pay to bring his uh, uh, wife and family along. But then they call conflicts because the wife want attention, the kids want attention, the promoter wants you to work. And when you come home from those long tours, you want to rest a little bit, not exactly jump into the fray. Well, exactly. You can't because right. now, because you have to, you ain't been around your wife, so you have to give her attention, and especially your kids. You know, for a wrestler with kids, he has no love life. No, really. All the kids take it all up. The moment you hit the door, the kids come running, jumping in your arms, and the kids were hanging around you the whole day. The poor woman, like the kids. No, I, the kids it's, are always priority. And they didn't one. see Absolutely. their dad. They didn't see their dad all week, so they're gonna be with him twenty four seven. Right. So you be the wife be lucky if she get a kiss before you go. Did your first wives before you wound up with the current Mrs. Atlas? Did they realize what a commitment it was to be married to a wrestler? They before? did. They did. And, yeah, they won. My first wife wanted me to quit, buy a mule, and plow a cornfield. She wanted you to buy a mule. Yeah, yeah really. Yeah. Of course, back in, you know they didn't have all them tractors like they do now. Most farms were done by mule and, and, and horse team, you know. And that wasn't the life for I you didn't know. want to walk behind a mule all day. No, I, I didn't. I didn't think I went to the gym, won all them contests to plow a cornfield with a mule. Well, in the end, look at how it worked out. You have a wonderful lady at home. Yep, yep. She's very understanding. She, uh, you know, she gets sad every time I go out of town or something. But I, I'm not on the road as much as I was then. So she had it. She, in other words, she got it easier. She never saw you at your peak. Right. Your big right. peak Now, if traveling. we used to go to Japan, even now or then, the Japanese are not going to fly you over there for one day. Normally, right. when guys go to Japan, they're there for four to six weeks. Like we did Legend House for WWE. That was a six-week taping. So I was away from home for six weeks. You didn't My wife, have weekends off or anything? No, 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 okay. no, no, no. They lock you in the house for a month and a half, and, and you just stay there. You don't, you're working. Right. Well, that's you know? what it is. So celebrity, you know, women that married to celebrity, they don't get to see all the glamour unless you marry a celebrity. Right. Because then she got her own life. So she, most of the time, you know, just like uh, when they, uh, the girl, Ozzy and... What the Osbournes, Sharon and Ozzy. Yeah, Ozzie, yeah, yep. they was able to travel together and stuff like that, you know, so it, it made it a lot easier when you got a, a woman. It's like right now, Triple H and Stephanie. 
So it's easy for them. They, you know, they both do the they same thing. They can travel thing. as they like. Right, right. right. Like Nettie Lightheart, she married to a wrestler. For a while, I, I believe, I don't know if he's still married to her, but Undertaker was married to um, Michelle McCool. They're still together, yep. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? So, you know, it makes it easier if you know marry somebody within your, uh, within your profession. But for a person not used to being a short time with the family, it, it's very hard on a lot of women. Do you think the current Mrs. Atlas would have been able to tolerate your WWF well, schedule in the mid -80s. You would have taken her with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. She's, just, she, she's from Germany. And so she, she's different than Americans. Okay. They, 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 European women are different than American women. They, they, they're a lot tougher. All right. Tough women. Inside. Inside. The things don't bother them as much. It takes a lot to get my wife going. She's very, they got a, like a real strong. Uh, strong willed? Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. They right. very understand it too. A lot more understand it, you know. Tony, so, we reached the, out. Oh. The the women the, when I was married to women here, they complained all the time. You know, everything was nothing was right. Couldn't make them happy. But with her, my biggest problem with my wife is to spend money on her. Really? Well, I guess there's worse problems in the world to have. I, I know, know. I'm not makes, complaining. She, she makes a lot wrong. of jewelry and but, whatnot. Yeah, she but probably the, decoys yeah, herself. Yeah. The other day, I, I was taking a shop. I saw this beautiful blouse. I said, oh, I'm going to get you this. It was on sale. You know, it normally was like $65. They were, it was a fifth of cent off or something sale. And I said, well, you know, $65 blouse here, you know, you get this for like $32. Right. She said, oh, that's too much. But if I want something... The sky's the limit. All right, all right. When it comes to me, she, she, don't, she don't think about money. I first noted what made me really fall in love with her. She would get up and fix me a three-course meal if I'm hungry. But then when she's hungry, she go in the refrigerator, take a slice of bread, throw some meat on, throw a piece of cheese on and eat. She won't, go, she won't do that for her. But she'd do it for you. She would do it for me. Isn't that nice? All right, Tony, we pulled the fans over at at MWF Project X on Twitter. They have some interesting topics, a great grouping of superstars we're going to discuss. Before we get to it, Tony, we're going to take a brief time out. You only, time made, out. We only made one mistake when you married the current Mrs. Atlas. What? You didn't use our good friends over at KL Wedding Coordinators. We should have done that. All right, fans, check that out. We'll be back after this brief time out. Carmella is champion! Carmella is money! Cleveland on Saturday, September 1st. Feel the thrill of WWE Live with a massive main event as AJ Styles teams up with Daniel Bryan and Jeff Hardy to take on Shinsuke Nakamura, The Miz, and Samoa Joe in a six-man tag team match. Plus, Asuka collides with Carmella for the SmackDown Women's Championship. And don't miss Charlotte Flair and The New Day Live. It's WWE Live in Cleveland on Saturday, September 1st. Tickets and VIP packages are available. I think WrestleMania 1 is what got Vince McMahon started. That's it. The buildup of that, everything about it, the timing, everything worked together. You know, even their enemies, uh, Ted Turner, were helping us. Because every other word, they would say something about WW, you know, F. I mean, yeah, the thing you do is don't say nothing about your enemy. Right. They didn't. <laughs> so they made us even better. Yep. Uh, they cut their own throat. Now, I don't think whatever her name is, Cindy Lauper, and all those people in that, all it did is give it a, that little glitter, but did it help? They come out there to see a show, buddy, and they got it. Wrestling fans around New England, WWE superstar The Boogeyman is coming to the bullpen. 59 Hanover Street in Lebanon, New Hampshire, Sunday afternoon, August the 26th, for an interactive meet and greet, autographs and pose photos. Visit thebullpennh.com to take advantage of this rare opportunity to meet the man from the bottomless pit. Lebanon, The Boogeyman is coming to get you live. Wrestling fans, welcome back to Memories and Legends. I'm Dan Marotti, joined by the two-time Hall of Famer, Tony Atlas. We've had some Interesting personal conversation. Now it's time to get into the the, the real nitty gritty of wrestling. There you go, the nitty gritty. In my day, I jumped down your throat, tap dance on your liver, and dare you hard to beat you piercing that geek. That's old wrestling. The good old days of wrestling. Yeah. yeah. Well, 
Call it what you will, WWE SummerSlam returns to Brooklyn, New York, the heart of uh, the WWE universe. Going back 50-some-odd years now, New York, New York, Madison Square Garden was always the home of the former WWF, mm -hmm. perhaps the greatest arena in the world to enjoy a live event experience. I mean, I didn't get to go during the quote-unquote good old days, but just right. to walk into that building knowing the history, looking up at that, the interesting design the they building. have on the ceiling. Well, they've had several incarnations yeah, of yeah, it, right. Yeah, yeah. The fans wanted to take a walk through memory lane with you, Tony, with some of the great champions that you experienced and were around during your great run. The first gentleman was one that wasn't a champion when you were there, but certainly one of the greatest superstars in the history of the profession, without a doubt, the greatest WWE champion of them all, a gentleman uh, that unfortunately passed away this year at the age of 82, the living legend Bruno San Martino. Yeah. Bruno was uh, a true gentleman in, in, in all sense of the world. He uh, didn't believe in drugs and alcohol, worked out all the time, uh, hard-working guy, and uh, very, very classic uh, individual. One of the strongest, I would say, at that time, probably one of the strongest men in the world. It's funny, I, mean, a I lot have of some of those words written right here. Yeah, a lot of classy, people don't realize classy. it, but... Bruno Sammartino had a bench press of 565 pounds. Wow. And he didn't take steroids or supplements or nothing. He just ate and worked out, ate mm -hmm. and worked out. And he would give you the shirt off of his back. He was uh, truly a, a, a friend to all. I mean, once you met Bruno, you just got, had this warm feeling about it. Great family man, raised his kid. You know, he was, he, he was a true champion. When did you first hear of Bruno San Martino? I know you started wrestling down in the South when you broke in. Did you hear of the legend of Bruno San Martino before you went to the WWF for the first time? Oh, yeah, yeah. with top magazines. and See, they didn't have cable television back then. Everything was uh, 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 syndicated. Syndicated. So you could have a wrestler to, uh, to wrestle. Because I wrestled with Bruno San Martino in Texas. Did you? Nobody knew who he was. You know, I, re I think it was Bruce Pritchard did an interview not too long ago. Nobody about knew that. who Bruno was, was. It was death yeah, silence. Once, once, once you left the, the uh, New England, they did like Chief J. Strongbow, nobody knows him once you leave New England. The same thing up here. If I say Wahoo McDaniels, nobody knows Wahoo McDaniels. Paul Jones. Paul Jones was U.S. champion. And right. all, I mean, he was a, the, one of the biggest stars that walked the face of earth. The only reason people know Dusty Rose is because he left and went to Vince. For a little while, yeah. Right. Uh, everything, everything was uh, 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 syndicated. TV, in my day, you could be wrestling in Boston Garden and play the bad guy. And then you could go down to uh, Maryland or somewhere. I mean, not Maryland, a little bit further. Go to Virginia, to Richmond, and play the good guy. They wouldn't have a clue what was going on because in another part TV, of the country. Because yep. the TV did not show you what went on. And then in 1971 or 72, a guy by the name of Ted Turner came along, and he created the first cable network in the 70s. And I remember the, some of the articles in the paper say he's, 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 he's crazy. What is wrong with him? Nobody in New York would care about what's going on in Texas, and nobody in Texas care about what's going on in California. You know, they, they was used to seeing, just, it was the local newspaper, the local news, and, and what went on in another country, you would have absolutely no clue of what went on in another country. Now, you could do something in Boston, and not only with people all over the United States sees it, everybody all over the world sees it. Not to get involved in politics or nothing, but I was in, in Nigeria, Africa, mm -hmm. in uh, 2004, and a guy from uh, uh, New Hampshire, Howard Dean, was running. I remember Howard Was running for president. And I was over in uh, Africa watching it, in Africa. And what it was, it was a, a dinner, for a peace dinner, to keep the Muslim and Christian from fighting each other. So they wanted to have something to bring them together, entertainment. So they chose wrestling, of all things. So we were, every time Howard Dean spoke, he was just putting it through Bush, just calling him everything but a child of God. Every Muslim over there in Africa at that time stood up and cheered. And I asked them why they cheered for Dean. They said, he support us. 
See, here we got what we call gray areas. Mm -hmm. They don't. It's black or white. You either with them or you're against them. If the president is against them and you're against the president, you support them. Strange strategy because they don't have all the gray areas. Like over here, if you do something, it's murder one, murder two, manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter. They've got about 10 different, we got about 10 different ways to explain murder in this country. They have one. Just one, you murder. Right. That's it. All right, circling back to Bruno San Martino, Tony, you heard about this great man through the magazines, through some of the other wrestlers that you worked with in different locker rooms. Your initial impressions of the man, did he live up to the expectations that he had been he set? Won, he won, he won a, he's a true, true meaning of a world champion. I would say that, that him, Nick Bockwinkle, we have wrestling champions there. I mean, these guys were class act. Yeah. They, 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 they could never be replaced. Never. I, I see the people now, they're they not, not in the same category as, as a Bruno San Martino, as not even a Ric Flair. I mean, Ric Flair was the most class act in this world I've seen. Ric Flair would go into a bar and... and uh, you, you laugh and joke with him, you go and pay your tab, or oh, a flyer took care of that. You, if he walked to a restaurant, Andre was like that too, Andre the Giant. Really? You go to a restaurant, Andre be sitting in a restaurant eating, and then he'd go up, he'd go up to the, the, the counter, and he would take care of everybody's tab in that restaurant. Really? If he's where that tab, Andre done that. The, one of the most underrated champions that this business I ever had is Harley Race. Great man we've had Harley right here in Race, the studio. Harley Race is highly respected by every wrestler. One of the reasons why, in real life, he could whoop just about anybody. I mean, if you say you whoop Harley Race, you did something, you see. But what they did in the, in the nannies, they got rid of wrestlers. They didn't want wrestlers around anymore. You know, guys that could really wrestle, that could really, you know, that was really into wrestling. Mm -hmm. And, and they got rid of it, and then they got a different group of guys with what you see now. You know, they call themselves wrestler, but they don't wrestle. But they say, I'm a wrestler, but they don't wrestle. How can you wrestle? Let me say, I'm a, I belong to a motorcycle club, but I don't have a bike. We know someone like that <laughs> here at the studio, but that's a different story yeah, for a different yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a different, people, people, like, like you said, people today look, looking for something different. Uh, uh, their attention span is uh, uh, a lot shorter now. So it's hard. Uh, we see things today, we forget about it tomorrow. Right. Every day we look for something different to see, something different to do. Where I just sit and watch Anna Griffin every week. Lucy Ball, I watch it every week. I didn't need to see something different. Now if you notice people... They're watching TV, commercial come on. We can't wait for that. We can't wait. Then we clipped so many in China. Now, what was I watching? Now, they forgot what the devil they were watching. That's, that's us now. We, something happened today. I don't care how dr dramatic it is. I don't care how bad it is. It only takes us two days to forget about it. And then we on. Um, thinking about, talking about something different. Jeez, and you know, and I, that's why wrestling got to constantly, constantly. See, we didn't have to change as much. You know, once you, like you talk about Bruno San Martino, 12 years, people right. was interested in watching Bruno. Yep. Today, 12 days, we got any more wrestlers back there? They, they would never, they, that's why I said they would never be another one. Like Huck Hogan was the last, last of that earl where people want to see this particular guy for so many years straight, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like in, in, in everything. I, when I, outside of New England, people don't like Tom Brady and the Patriots. I wonder why. They're a great team. I mean, you know, won more Super Bowls and everything. That's because they see him all the time. They want another quarterback, another team to, to be in the Super Bowl. They don't want to see this team in, in the Super Bowl no more. You see? They were so happy when, when they lost Oh, good, we don't have to watch the Patriots this year. We, we constantly want something different all the time. If you notice, wrestlers don't stay as long as Bruno. No. You know, a wrestler, uh, if, if he's there for uh, more than a year, the fans want to see a new wrestler a year later. They can turn on the top guys pretty quick. Well, we the same thing with week. everything. A person right. buy a brand new car, 
they pay, they take them three to four years to pay it off. As soon as they make that last payment, what you, they're looking for another one. Person buys a cell phone. They, they got a cell phone in the hand, and they in Verizon looking at the new ones. I got to get one of these. But what's wrong with the one you got? Nothing. I just want one of these. That's how we are. And they're getting, when I was in Guatemala, Central America, this is wrestling now. Right. I'm in Guatemala, Central America, 1975. Me and Don Canuda and Roberto Soto, I remember they was on, the, and Manuel Soto was on the car. Mm -hmm. And it was the same year they had a big earthquake that killed over 2,000 people. Wow. We left two days before. Well, this young lady that I used to, in my day, we used to date. People don't date no more. What do they do? They get it on right away. Oh, all right. Yeah, we used to date first. Not me. But... Yeah, yeah, we couldn't. I mean, you, 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 you went a month holding hands. <laughs> <laughs> as far as you went, you hold hands, you could carry her books, and then if you was lucky, after about six eight weeks up, you may get a kiss. It was, it was dating. You know, it was slow, slow. Gradual process. build up. It was a gradual build up. It wasn't like I meet you in the bar tonight, come on, baby. None of that. But anyway, make a long story short. I was getting ready to go back to the States. So prior to, to me leaving, I bought her clothes. I bought her mother clothes. I bought her father clothes. I bought food. I took them out to dinner. I ran and down them. I went to say goodbye to her and to get her address so I'm going to keep in touch. Her mother met me at the door and said, you cannot see my daughter. I said, why not? I said, all I did for you, I can't even see her. She said, we are Christians. And then the Bible said, thou should not lie. You are a liar. What would you lie about, Tony? That's what I asked her. Right. I said, what did I lie about? She said, my daughter asked you, were you rich? And you told her no. I said, well, I'm not rich. I said, I make about 100 grand a year. That's not rich. In a, you know, that's not rich. She said, uh, <clears throat> do you have a stove? I go, yes, ma'am. Refrigerator? Yes, ma'am. Television? Yes, ma'am. A car? Yes, ma'am. Then how can you have so much and not be rich? You're a liar. See, over there, if you got all the necessity of life, you consider a rich person. Over here, you have to have more than God Almighty before you start feeling rich. Made you appreciate what you had a little bit, we huh? have, We don't have that appreciated. We need more and more and more and more. We you consume more in one year than all the country around the world put together. All right. Well. We are big consumers of things. And I never realized it. And that's the thing about wrestling. See, when you talk about wrestling, it ain't all just in the ring. The wrestler learned things outside of the ring. Like, I learned that if you're on television and you badmouth a U.S. president, you supporting terrorism. I never, that never dawned on me. They against the president. You against the president. Y'all working together. I never realized it. My brother went to Vietnam. He said that the Vietnamese were ready to give up. They saw the people protest the street. They said, hold on one more month. The, the Americans are leaving. So they don't see things the way we see things. Right. When we go to these different countries, we have to learn their cultures. And when we so open and free and speak, I'll speak, you know, speak so freely, not thinking about the countries, the consequences of our word. But when I like, if I, I went to, uh, where was I at? Karek. Mm -hmm. And they had the people to meet us getting on the, the uh, getting off the plane and everything. So I shook hand, going by, we shaking hands. It was a woman there. Really? So I didn't want her to feel left out. Mm -hmm. So I stuck my hand out to shake her hand. The security guard hit my hand so hard I nearly broke. I said, what that for? He said, if you had test her in public, three years in jail, no question asked. Really? You can't test a woman in public in, uh, on a, in correct. Wow, wow. Kuwait is all is a Muslim country, and you can't do that. There's a lot of stuff that I learned, like in Japan. Yeah. I, I learned this thing about going to Japan. In, in Japan, this is what they believe. First impression, last impression. So whatever impression you leave on that Japanese person, when he first meets you, he will never leave it. They keep that impression all the time. In Japan, you have to be prompt. Me and Don Morocco, we were getting on the bus in Anshi in Japan. 
Oh, that must have been a trap. And, and I would always be friendly to the fans. The guy told me the bus leave at 9 o'clock. It leaves at 9 o'clock, not 9.01. At 9 o'clock, nine o'clock. The bus leaves. So I stopped to sign a couple of autographs for a couple of kids. The guy shut the door. <laughs> He's pulling off. So I'm bailing on the door. Where you going? So Don Morocco asked the guy to stop the bus to let me on. I got on the bus. They never brought me back. Really? I asked him why. I stopped the bus. Wow. The bus leave at 9 o'clock. If you late, you have no honor. You, uh, you have no respect, no honor. Honor to them means everything. No honor. When I was in Kuwait, I asked a woman one time, I said, she had two kids. I said, are you married? She said, well, of course I'm married. I, 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 I'm married. I got kids. Right. You- See, you ask an American girl, are you married? She could say yes or no. But over there, you don't have kids. It's an after marriage. Right. Right. No. So we had to get to learn all these different cultures, you know, and that's what wrestling. Like I said, a lot of stuff you learn from wrestling, you won't learn from no books. Right. Because the people that write the books, what I learned, they want to put in perspective what they see. Like in the Middle East, if you're a guest, they would take care of you for three days, whether they could afford it or not. When the wrestlers come from other countries here, they're on their own. There's nobody meeting them at the airport. We go to Japan, they got a big bus waiting for us. They put on the bus, they got a guy, they take around. We go to France, they take care of us. We go to Germany, they take care of us. We go to Puerto Rico, they take care of us. We go to New York, you're on your own, buddy. Go get your rent a car. They don't even give you a direction. All right, let's circle back, Tony. One line that you always use that I have come to appreciate a great deal is that uh, in a lot of people's eyes, the wrestling industry didn't begin until 1985, around the time of the first WrestleMania, the Rock and Wrestling Bowl. No, it boom. ended. Well, no. Wrestling ended, not begin. It ended in 85. Stay with me for a minute. Wrestling. People look at WrestleMania as the first big event back right. in Madison Square Garden, March of 1985. If you circle back a few years, though, I know WWE likes to recreate history and say it was in smoke-filled rooms and whatnot before that uh, mid-'80s period began. You were part of an ultra-successful event in August of 1980. Shea Stadium. Shea Stadium. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't the first Shea Stadium show either. I know. That was the first one The first one, one Bruno though. took a wrestle of Pedro Morales. Right. The second one, Bruno took a wrestle against uh, uh, Larry Zabisco. Larry Zabisco. Now, right. that was a hot feud for its time, was it yeah. not? But Bruno they had a bigger wrestle I mean, going on for many, many years. I mean, down in Louisiana, JYD was selling out the Superdome, which is just as big as Shea Stadium. Right. And then in Texas... The Von Erks, they, 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 they were selling out uh, the stadium there. But it was no cable. Right. And what did so that, really what came WrestleMania, with that mid-80s boom was WWE WrestleMania, on MTV. The first WrestleMania was smaller. It was closer. It was primarily, smaller, yeah. it was smaller than uh, our Shea Stadium. It was smaller than what went on in Texas. And it definitely was smaller than what was going on in Puerto Rico. They were selling out these big stadium in Puerto Rico. But it didn't get the coverage. You see, what happened was they bought up all the tapes. So there's a lot of wrestlers that is sitting on a shelf. Like, for example, when they bought WCW, what happened to the tapes? People can't see that. See? To build your product, you had to bury other things. Don't let, don't let them see that. Show them only this. That way they think, this is it. Some of the best wrestlers I've ever seen in my life the world never saw them. They own another tape, another company. Like Georgia Championship Wrestling were the first cable network. So all wrestlers from all over. It went into 48 different states back in the 70s. Yeah. So when I went to New York, they knew who I were. My first match, everybody knew who Tony. Vince didn't build Tony Atlas. Georgia Championship Wrestling built Tony Atlas. Vince didn't build Hulk Hogan. Vern Gagne built Hulk Hogan. Vince didn't build JYD. Bill Watts built JYD. Vince didn't build Ted DiBiase. V- Bill Watts did it. And they all went on that cable television. So when a lot of these wrestlers came here, they was already they known. familiar with them, right? Because of, the, because of Ted Turner. So Ted Turner uh, was the first one to market wrestling all over the world, you see. And then a lot of them, they sold their territory to the WWE. And a lot of stuff is, is where... 
from what I hear, I, I, I don't have a computer. My wife got one. They got that 24 7 where they show a lot of old. It's called WWE Network now. Yeah, they show a lot of old stuff. But I still waiting to see some of the guys like Wahoo McDaniels, Paul Jones, Johnny Weaver. You know, these guys, because they was mid Atlantic, they were right. down south. They never get shown up here. You see a match with Wahoo McDaniel, you would go nuts. You can say that again. I mean, that Indian boy, let me tell you, that rascal. You ever see what? More, my God. He beat Ric Flair like a, like, like a Tom Tom. Him and, and Steamboat, Rick is, the Dragon Steamboat, man, them guys, man, they, they had it. I mean, they, you know, Rufus Off, Freight Train, Joan. You know, you don't see these guys because they, from, they was wrestling down south. You go out to Texas like Larry the Axe Hennett. You talk about a man. Larry the Axe Hennet hit me so hard that, he, that, that I, thought, I, I thought a truck hit me. 22-inch neck. I, the 22-inch forearm. He hit me and knocked me right through the rope. I landed in the third row. Really? Yeah. And he was making, he was laughing while he was doing it. He said, hey, kid, don't keep falling down. So he hit me and knocked me down again. I told you, don't go down. I said, well, stop hitting me then. But just powerful, powerful. Gene Anderson, the Minnesota record crew, Gene and Ole Anderson. You're talking about tag teams. I mean, they've never been a tag team. The people didn't get to know Ole until they started the Four Horsemen. Right. There was no Orrin Anderson. On, when these guys were dressing, Orrin Anderson was going to high school. When I was competing in, uh, in, in, in the, the World Championship in Denton, Texas, 1988, Stone Cold Steve Austin was going to school at that time. He was a school kid. Yeah. He used to come down. He used to come down and, and, and ask me for my autograph, Stone Cold. So wow. I seen a lot of these. The Rock. I used to babysit him in the back. And these are people. If you all these people talk about wrestling, they always start in from 1990 up. It was like wrestling didn't exist before 1990 because there was no cable television. Let me ask you this, Tony. Back to Bruno. In guys of that generation, do you think one of the reasons why they were able to pack baseball stadiums, football stadiums, and so on, regional territories as opposed to national companies, was it a believability factor? Is that why they were so successful they met him in, in person. such a smaller area? I mean, you saw P Bruno in person. His present, you said, I got to go see this guy, Rasser. Now you got Shawn Michael, five foot six, 130 pounds, beating up everybody. So again, once you go... see him in person, you're disappointed. See? Now, if you see Triple H in person, you're not disappointed. You see Mark Henry in person, you're not disappointed. You saw Larry Dax Henry in person, you are not disappointed. They don't have the same statue of, of men. The average woman on there weighs about 110 pounds. See, people don't know TV put about 20 pounds on you. Mm -hmm. When you're on TV, you look about 20 pounds heavier. Now, John Cena, he's a beast. Yeah. You see him in person, he's just as impressive in person as he is on television. On, on television. Right. But a lot of guys, they look bigger and stronger. And then when you see him in person, it's not the same as you see. So that's why they keep them separated now. They don't let the fans get close to them. We had a guy in Tennessee one time, Dundee. Bill Dundee. Bill Dundee. Yep. He, was about, he was about five, six, five, <laughs> five, five, six. <laughs> Well, Memphis kind of had a unique style they, to its well, territory. Yeah, it was kind of honky tonk like that wrestling, Yeah, right? honky tonk. They, was, they wasn't very tall. They were smaller wrestlers. So one day he was out signing an autograph, and Jerry the King Lauder was looking for him. He said, where is he? That's he over there, that crowd. But he was so short, <laughs> couldn't nobody see him. So what Jerry the King Lauder did when they got a stool and told him to stand on the stool so he could be above the people, so he don't look. He said, people look at wrestling being bigger than life. See, I was always what you call a good guy because mm -hmm. I wasn't big enough to be the heel. See? Now, I you was were a big guy. But I was small. In that era. In that era, I was a small guy. Black Jack Mulligan and all them guys. When you, them, them guys was huge. Now you're talking. Oh, that. yeah, Big John Stubb and Black Jack Lanza and Mulligan and them guys. They were, they were like huge. Angela Mosca. Andrew Mosca looked like Lurch in his younger days. <laughs> and they was rough. The, one of the toughest guys that ever walked the face of the earth was not J Greg Valentine. People never knew the father. Johnny Valentine. Oh, sure. Yep. Johnny Valentine. And Johnny didn't pull punches. He wanted you to believe, no matter what you thought of the show. He wanted you to he believe in him. He hit you so hard, your tears were coming in your eyes. Wow. And Ric Flair, 
the same way, the same way. Ric Flair would chop you into oblivion. I saw him as when he was in his 60s, chopping them young kids that, that they pushing that. Yeah. And Ric Flair, him, an old man's like chopping on. They had to take him out of the ring before he hurt one of them young boys. You got that right. With Bruno, you were there for his farewell. Um, I think it was at the opening of the Meadowlands. Were you surprised to see him come back right around at the beginning of the WrestleMania era with his son, David San Martino. I didn't see it. You were, you were in, in WWF in 1985. Yeah, but... Uh, I hate to say that I'm black. You're black. Yes. All right. We couldn't get involved in stuff. When, when they were doing stuff, me and SD would ease away. Mm -hmm. We couldn't voice ourselves. And then when we did say something or, or try to get involved or ask questions, we got on what they call the S list. The shit list? Yeah. All right. Yep. So, so you didn't feel like you could give a lot no, of creative no, input? No, 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 All no, no. Right. As soon as I started talking and asking questions and want to do things, I found myself out the door. See, a lot of, a lot of things, we had a certain place in life. My job was to sit in that corner, keep my mouth shut, and do as I told. That was my job. Now, I've seen other guys go to Vince, talk to him about problems, and discuss problems and stuff. I couldn't do that. The, the moment I did, I'm a troublemaker. And did that actually happen to you? Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Ronnie Piper even wrote about him in his book. Vince had a meeting, and uh, he was going to make Pat Pallas on the booker. So he asked, say, are there any questions? So I watched guys ask questions and stuff. And I said, hey. He's better than the father. I can ask a question. So I figured all of a sudden I could do what the white people do. You know, I started feeling like I was white. This is 1980, 87, 88. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking I'm white there. So I said, Vince, can I ask you a question? So I asked him a question, you know. A week later, I was gone. Really? Now, oh. what did you ask him? I asked him, I said, uh, the last time I, that I was in uh, Madison Square Garden, I got this amount of money. I said, but we went back and we sold out. How come my paycheck, my paycheck, the other guy's paycheck goes up, but not my paycheck? And he said, well, you know, the money have to go. He gave me this long line of questions of where you got the money got to go with this, the money got to It's in Ronnie Piper's book. Piper told the story. I forgot all about it. Piper told the story in his book. You mm -hmm. ever got his book? I do at home. Yeah, you read it we'll about the tone that. He said this. The way he put it, this muscle man stood up and, and asked how come that our pay don't go up with the houses. You know, they're getting more people, right. they're selling gimmicks and stuff, but our pay stay the same. And he said, we all became successful and we all made more money. Everybody but Tony, he was gone. Is that what, around the time that you Same thing with Mark Henry. Mark Henry can't speak up. Why is that? Same thing. Even Mark, in 2018? Yeah, yeah. The world ain't changed that much. Well, I'd like to think it has. Uh, yeah, we all would, but it takes time for things. It, it, you know, it takes time. Well, all, in, of, all in good time. All in good time. Speaking all of change, time. do you think a character like Bruno San Martino could work in WWE no. in 2018? No. Why is that? Bruno was a very proud man. And, uh, he, he, took, he took his job very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. And he had very strong will. And uh, I just couldn't see him coming out dressed like uh, in costumes. And they probably put him in a chicken soup today. You think they'd gimmick him up? Oh, they would gimmick him up. Yeah. Right there. yeah he would come out, and just come out with sausages hanging around his neck or something. Come on. Spin a pizza in there. You but don't think a character they, they, like Bruno they, could no, resonate no, they, with the no, fans they nowadays? Let, they wouldn't no. let him be Bruno. They wouldn't let me be me. What do you think they'd do with you in 2018? Well, the first time I worked for Vince Jr., not senior, I became an African. Saba Simba. I was bouncing around in a grass skirt and a spear. Now, I must have been, <laughs> I think I was in the fifth. Boogie, boogie, boogie. Boogie, 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 boogie. Boogie, boogie. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> I That's think, what Vince wanted me to do. I, and then I came back to the sucker time. I was Mark Henry Flunkett. And the third time, uh ha 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 ha, uh ha 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 ha, boing, boing, boing. Now, you got booty hole. You're not a, you don't like the new day. 
their characters at least. They return off to you. I know you've said All that. All they have to do, whatever had to come out, I look for the clown car. You don't see it though. I see the clown car coming out. Every time I see him, I say, here come the clown. It's like a circus. You got the clown, you got the acrobat, you got the strong man. Nobody take them guys seriously. Come on. Big old strong guy come out in, 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 in light blue and pink, blowing a horn with no tune to it, <laughs> and calling himself, a, he called himself butt holes. What do you think a booty hole is? Well, I didn't really give it that much thought. That's what they call them. They're booty holes, right? Ain't that what it is? Booty, booty holes. holes? No, booty holes. It's like yeah, a yeah, cereal. Yeah, yeah, you know what it is. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I'm not saying I don't, but all right, Tony, let me I ask you this. I thought it said booty hole. It goes back to believability. Yeah. Is any of this believable? I don't know. It, it, but in people, the Bruno Martino, he was believable. People don't want reality no more. They don't. That's why the company grew. Nobody want what is for real no more. We love sand fiction. What is the, the, some of the, I go to the Comic-Con. Star Trek is as big now as ever been. Yeah, Star the, Wars the best, the best program on TV right now is The Walking Dead. Nobody, the whole world have changed. That's why he changed it. Nobody want to see a Bruno today. He was a very serious, athletic, Good guy. People hate good guys. They hate good guys. If you listen to John Cena talk, and then you play an interview of Ric Flair, they're doing the same interview. But Flair did his in the 70s. And for a person that brags on himself and put people down in the 70s, that was not a good person. When you make fun of people and put people down. Ric Flair did it, bragging about how great he was. Muhammad Ali bragged about how great he was. People hated him. Today, a guy could brag about himself and get cheered. See? Different era. It's a different, different era. Different society. There is no more good guy. Bob Backlund was the last of the good guy, and people started hating Bob Backlund, calling him highly duty. They say he was too nice. We try, they try to make Arnold Schwarzenegger into a, a, a villain with Terminator. Yeah. Terminator 2, they had to make him a good guy. People liked him. Trying to we, baby face. We love the bad guy. How successful was it that It started with, with, with James Stewart. With, uh, uh, Jim, what, what guy would you ride a motorcycle on? Jimmy Dean? Dean was his name. James Dean? James Dean, yeah. With, with the girls started going for the bad guy with the bike and the leather jacket. Uh, the look. Yeah, yeah, the look. And then all of a sudden, you know, being a good guy, we would call it. if you was a good guy, even now today, when I was coming up, a guy that did, now, a good guy, he was called weird, a nerd, a, a, a freak. If you smoke dope, drink whiskey, fight, did everything against the rules of society, you was called cool. If you did all the right things in life, you was called a nerd. You don't think Bruno could be cool in 2018? Bruno would have been a nerd today. All right. Well, fans... Again, a very interesting subject. The world, we don't, we, you got to realize, Bruno came up during a time where we did the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag, we did a, we, we did, we did a law where we, we, we had respect for adults, kids respect their parents, kids had chores. It was a different world. We grew up in a world of, of respect, dignity, and, and righteousness. The world now is disrespectful. All your program you see now, I watch some of these, uh, what do you call these things, the reality shows? Yeah. We, we promote, like the divas, I can't watch that. A bunch of rich girls sitting around complaining. Now, who wanted, how are you going to get interested in watching people that got everything, everything, and not happy complaining about everything? When I watch the, the, like the Housewives of Atlanta and all the rich women complaining, that's all they do, complain the whole program. Now, in the olden days, if, if, if a person had that much money were complaining, we would say that she is ungrateful. Mm -hmm. Now, she's cool. So he had to change with the time. Right. It's great that you keep going back to that earl, mm -hmm. but the young people don't understand what you're talking about. Because exactly. when they was born, that, that lifestyle was gone. Right. Was gone. 
You know, you had the wrestling never created anything. What people don't know, a wrestler job was supply and demand. There was a demand for something, we supply it. You know, people want to see good versus evil in my day. Now they just want to see violence. You think so? Well, look at the program. There's uh, no good versus evil no more. There's no good guys and bad. When you watch them wrestling now, how can you tell who the good guy and the bad guy? Very difficult. Because they're both doing the same thing. Exactly. They're both putting each other down. They're both bad mouth for each other. They, they, they're both doing the same thing. That's a great point. How can you tell who's the good guys and the bad guy? You knew in the 50 who was the good guy. You knew who was the bad guy. Like John Wayne, the old John Wayne movie. John, John Wayne would take your lip, he'd put up with your crap, and, tell you, and he had absolutely enough of it, then he'd punch you in the nose. But you had to bring it apart. Today, they punch you in the nose before you even, the movie star. All right, well. It's a different, it, the, the, world is, the world is different now. A lot of stuff that uh, we used to live by, codes, even in wrestling. Wrestlers in my day was like a family. I, I was with Alpha and Sika and Rocky Johnson just this weekend. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the brotherhood that we had, me and Rocky and all of us guys. We were like brothers. I do anything, them guys do anything for me, I do anything for them. Today, I go in the dressing room, this guy over here on his iPod, this guy is doing something. They're not even talking, they don't even talk to each other no more. Valid point. Very we, valid. You go in the old fashioned dressing room back in the old days when Tony Remo was around. Yep. When you first started, guys laughing and joking, hugging. Hey, brother, how you doing? How the family? Blah, blah, blah. Now you walk in the dressing room, you can hear a rat piss on cotton. They don't even say hi to you no more. Everybody's in their own little cocoon. So the brotherhood and all that, a, a lot of stuff, it, it's great. You know, I, I love, I, I'm happy that I was brought up and I got to see that mm -hmm. when it was, when wrestling was wrestling. wrestling. I was able to, to experience that. When, when the boys look after each other, when the boys supported each other, and they would help each other. I remember I go in the ring, if I do something wrong, some old timer would pull me over to the side, and he would say, hey kid, you mad taking a little advice? You ain't gonna get mad if I give you a little advice? Some constructive criticism, we call it constructive criticism. So he would pull me over to the side, say, look, do this, do that, don't do that, don't do that. He would try to help me. Today, I do something wrong. Hey, Vince, he's screwing up again. He would try to cut my throat today. Yeah. That's the difference. All right. Tony, in a couple of sentences, can you sum up the man, in the a champion that Bruno San Martino we knew, that you knew, I should say? The champion? The living legend. Bruno San Martino is one of the wonders of the world. It was my absolute pleasure to get to know and meet him. And there would never be another one with his class, his strength, his elegance, and his love for, his, for the business and his love for, his, for the fans. Bruno never had nothing bad to say about nobody. Can't nobody in all of his 80-some years of living, there's not one person walking the face of the earth to have anything bad to say about the one and only great Bruno San Martino. God bless you, my friend. Isn't that nice? All right, fans, right now we're going to take a brief time out. When we come back, we'll have more Memories and Legends. Carmella is champion! Carmella is money! Lafayette on Tuesday, September 11th. WWE SmackDown Live returns with a massive main event as AJ Styles teams up with Daniel Bryan and Jeff Hardy to take on Shinsuke Nakamura, The Miz, and Samoa Joe in a six-man tag team match. Plus, Asuka collides with Carmella for the SmackDown Women's Championship. And don't miss Charlotte Flair in the New Day Live. It's WWE SmackDown Live in Lafayette on Tuesday, September 11th. Tickets and ringsider packages are available. You think you know your favorite superstar? Did you know about Sasha's favorite cousin? What about AJ's tattoos? Chris Jericho's expensive taste? No. You need the book that has everything you want to know about more than 200 of your favorite WWE superstars. It's the WWE Ultimate Superstar Guide. Stephanie came in the dressing room where I would have had me in a dressing room where can nobody see me. 
And uh, that was my first time ever meeting her, but she said she met me when she was a little girl, but I can't remember. Mm -hmm. And treated me so nice, and they told me what they wanted to do. Even when I was doing it, I wasn't for sure uh, what, what divas were. Mm -hmm. I slept in cars, all because I didn't have enough money to get myself a motel room. So they came back and they said, Baba said, please do the job for John A's. I said, nope, I ain't doing it. And they are doing them, come on, go on and do the job for it. It ain't gonna hurt you, go on and do the job. I said, fuck you too. <laughs> Wrestling fans, welcome back to another installment of Marys and Legends. I'm Dan Marotti, joined by my buddy, Tony Atlas, a man that knows how to tell a story. I talk too much. I don't know if I'd go that far. Well, I've been but around anyway. a long time. I've, I've been around a long time. I've seen a lot. I mean, I've been, I've been in this business for 50 years. Well, you know what? The name of the show is Memories and Legends. It's not yeah, just legends. You have a lot of memories, too. I got a lot of, a lot of memories. Sometimes they come to me in odd times. You know, you may ask me about Bruno, and I started thinking about... Kuwait. <laughs> Kuwait. Because <laughs> it's all power of it. it hey, it's hard it's to fine. separate it. You know, it's hard to separate because it's all power of wrestling. You know, meeting people, learning different cultures, learning how to live in different places. You know, you go to Japan, nobody over there speaks no English. All right, you know, when you go to these countries, like you go to Russia, somewhere deep guys, Russia, ain't nobody speak no English. I found out one thing about us Americans, though. What's that? We can't survive outside of America. Really? No. We couldn't even survive in Canada. Well, I've been to Canada. Well, we wouldn't be able to live there. We don't even, because they, like, like we have miles. Yeah. And they don't have miles. Kilometers. Yeah, yeah. Most Americans don't know what a kilometer is. All right, well, let's talk about a man that maybe. So, how are we going to read the sad? I was trying to find how many miles is that? <laughs> so you got Google. I just nowadays. left Canada last week. Yeah. I was, uh, this and year you alone. You survived. Yeah, but I was with a Canadian. Okay. That's how I do. I get with somebody. I know what the hell they go. <laughs> All right, Tony. Let's talk about a man. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't know what a kilometer is. A man that was white hot is a WWE World Champion. Uh, you weren't there for during his championship run, but certainly interacted with him during some of his returns to the company. A very controversial figure, to say the least. I'll try and leave some of my personal opinions out of it. I'll save those for my book. Superstar Billy Graham. I love you Billy the, Graham. You, oh, really? I love, oh, okay. I love Superstar. See, me and Superstar, we go way back. I was around Superstar when we were champion because Superstar tribal. Mm -hmm. See you, brother. When you, were, when you were world champion back then, you didn't stay no one place. You traveled. I wrestled Superstar Billy Graham at the Atlanta Auto Terrier in 1976, I wrestled him on Georgia Championship Wrestling. That's how champions used to do back in them days. They didn't just wrestle for WWF back then, or mm -hmm. WWE, whatever they were call it. They went different places. Harley Race went to New York. When Ric Flair, when he was champion, he came up to New York. They traveled. They was world champion. So when you held a title, Nick Bockwinger did, just didn't wrestle just in Minnesota. I wrestled Nick Bockringer in Georgia for the, for the title. I wrestled Harley Race in Texas and everywhere for the title. Ric Flair, I wrestled Ric Flair in Georgia and everywhere. And they, they tribal. So, yes, I knew even during the time Superstar was champion, I met Superstar and met a new Superstar, Andre the Giant. He tribal. Now, it's only one organization, so they don't. They don't, they don't go, go to different places. Yeah, the but they, they, won't, they won't go like, you would never get a WWE champion to wrestle somebody in TNA. Right. It, it just ain't going to happen. But back then, you could get an AWA champion to wrestle a WWF champion. Yeah. Like, the, the, they do it all the time in Texas. Like, Nick Bockwinkel would go there and wrestle the Von Earth. And the Paul Harley Bosch Race show. would yeah. go there. Harley Race, the NWA champion. He went to wrestle in, in Texas. And Nick Bockwinkel was the, the, the AWA champion, and he went to Texas. You see what I'm saying? So the guys, would, they would go to Japan, Puerto Rico, uh, South America, Guatemala. They, they, they were world champion. Right. Do you think it's fair to say superstar Billy Graham was the poster child for the steroid generation in professional wrestling? Uh, no. 
Who were the big steroid guys before Billy Graham? The football Graham? players. Who? Okay. Football. I'm, the guys in left professional football. wrestling yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah. See, see, when I first started wrestling, it was about chewing tobacco and beer. Mm -hmm. that's, what they, that's what they did. Then when they started getting the football players in, they were the one that brought the pills and the steroids. So I wouldn't blame it on superstar, but all the guys that played, the, that came from football. You know, they brought the stuff. Like, uh, I got my, dislocated my knee one time, walking with my Daniel, who used to play for Miami. He opened up his bag, and that's go to pain pills. Mm -hmm. Most of these wrestlers, if they had a pain, the wrestlers, they would just get a six-pack of beer. Right. That's how they and did ride to the beer. next city, yeah. Or just a six-pack of beer. You know, take a couple of a six-pack of beer. They get that old Chattanooga chew, and that's how they dealt with pain. But then the football player... So, so all that, the wrestler is taking the blame for it, but all that came from when the guy that left football brought it into wrestling. So, so no, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't blame any wrestler for the use of steroids because that came from football players. I'm saying in professional wrestling, he kind of inspired a generation of the No, the there was a lot of guys, guys doing it back then, too, before his time. Like who? Uh, well, you, you, you had a bodybuilder, Earl Maynard, you know, uh, there was a lot of guys, Sailor Out Thomas. I mean, these guys were oh, way really? before him. Yeah, 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 really? yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they was way before him, but they all used to play football. And so the, all that stuff came out of the, came, when the guys were So they the kind of brought it in to right, the professional in. wrestling genre. Right, right? the reason Superstar is so well known about it because he, he had charisma, he was on top, you know, he, you know, he, he was the world champion. Just right. like, it's like when, when, when the higher you go in life, and you do something wrong, you get punished more from it, you know. Mm -hmm. And most of the guys that was that really brought the stuff, then they never reached the uh, the status that uh, that our uh, superstar reached. So of course he gonna get the blame for uh, say that that that's where it started. It didn't start in wrestling. Steroid didn't hit wrestling until I mean really hit it until the eighties. Yeah, yeah. But the, around the mid '80s, the, well, I wasn't the familiar hit. with Sailor Rod Thomas, but yeah. I mean Billy Graham was the first guy that really got a push based upon that bodybuilding physique yeah. that he had. Yeah, and he became white hot as WWF World Champion right. when he beat Bruno San Martino. Right. For it. You really weren't around uh, the McMahon company at that point, but you were when Billy had a a very a, I'll call it maybe a bizarre comeback. Right. A Gorilla Monsoon had stated in a Philadelphia newspaper that Billy Graham was dead. And then uh, maybe a year or so after that, he showed up back in the company, certainly not looking anything like the, the bleach blonde, steroid up individual. He had uh, this ninja character <laughs> with the dark mustache, and he looked like he was 60 years old. What happened to superstar Billy Graham, Tony? You got to ask Billy Graham that. You don't know. I don't know. He See, as I was saying, dramatic pause. Wrestlers are not friends. They business associates. We only see each other in the dressing room and in the ring. Once that show is over, we all go our separate ways. We don't call each other at Christmas time. We don't visit each other. We have nothing to do with each other outside of wrestling. Nothing. It's all in the dressing room and the ring. Once the lights goes off, everybody's scattered like a bunch of rats going in their own little holes. We don't hang out with each other. We don't party together. Now, in the olden days, they had what's called cliques. Mm -hmm. So certain guys would hang out together. But then once that wrestler left that territory, he was forgotten about. It keeps moving on because every wrestler are subcontractors. They all work for themselves. It's not like a team. A team like the New England Patriots, they teammates. In, in wrestling, everybody in that dress room is my competition. Wrestling, the best way to put it, is a dog-eat-dog -dog sport, and you must get your bite out of it. 
And who told you that line? I know you told me before. Magdal Vasham. A Hall of Fame himself. Magdal Vasham told me that. And he didn't lie. I used to call wrestlers my friend. Mm -hmm. Then I ran on some hard time, became homeless. I knew more millionaires than Rockefeller. And I couldn't bum a quarter off each one of them. I could go right now, wrestle for WWE, stay there for a whole year, collect guys' phone number. Vince could fire me a year later, and not one person would pick up that phone. I'm gone. Once you leave it. When you were released in 2010, did you hear from anyone? Teddy Long. That's it? That's it. Not Mark Henry? Mark Henry once in a while, but mainly Teddy Long. Teddy. I got Teddy, the only one that I could call, he'd pick up that phone. Wow. Well, it is a texting generation, right? I could text him, too. Right. I know his text. I believe you. But you ask any other guy, they all tell you the same thing. Once you're gone, you're out, you're gone, you're done. And the guys, like the Brody incident, guy laying on the floor bleeding to death. All day they, they were thinking, but they was going over their match. Right. Guy on the floor bleeding. What are you going to do tonight? Are you kidding me? Well, let me ask you this. In 1986. You could die I, in that ring. Won't stop that show. We have unfortunately seen that. Ain't nothing to stop it. it. Hey, get him out of there as soon as you can. He's holding up the show. I hear that said. I heard it. That's get him a, out of that ring. He's holding up my show. Isn't that a sad fact? That That's you can actually man. say that honestly. Because, because you can say it honestly. People don't realize, people don't realize it's an individual sport. There's no team. It's individual. Everybody there is a subcontractor. The only people that is WWE employees are people that work in the office. Every wrestler is a subcontractor. Every man is for himself. They're not friends. They're business associates. That's what makes wrestlers so great and so competitive. Even as tag team partners. One partner would try to get with other one. Fuji tries his best to get with him. Saido. Really? Chief Strombo tries his best to get with a jewel. You ever talk to Jewel Strombo? His worst enemy there was his partner. We all know about you and Rocky Johnson. Yeah, we your partner, your partner is your worst enemy. He want to get rid of you. Well, that way he had it all to himself. See, there's only one room. There's only room for one at the top. At the top. And people don't realize we start talking about individual competitiveness. Same thing in boxing. Not trying to knock wrestling. I love wrestling. But it's an individual thing. Every guy is out there for himself. Every guy is out there for his family, his kids. And they can give a red ass what happened with you after you out of that door. In fact, they will celebrate because that secured their job a little bit more. Every time they bring in a new wrestler, you know what the wrestler's like thinking? I wonder who job he's going to take. There's only so much space. There's only so many positions. Right. So if you got position for 60 wrestlers, and then all of a sudden Vince going to hire two more wrestlers, and all position is full, what do you think them 60 wrestlers the is thinking? The axe is coming, and we're not talking about Larry Henry. They're looking around to see who, and so that's when they start cutting each other's throat. And what they know about you, that's when they start talking about it. Well, and they make sure it get to, in the right place, too. All right, Tony. You and were... when they tell a story, another thing from Mad Dog Vashon. All right. If a story is worth telling, it's worth embellishing. Embellishing. All embellishing. Right. There you go. Close enough. All right, Tony, you were an athlete. What did I say? I don't even know. I don't either. Yeah. <laughs> you were an athlete. You sampled in steroids at times throughout your career. What did you think? When you saw a broken down, de decrepit superstar Billy Graham come back to WWF in 1986 needing a new hip, his whole body destroyed from the abuse he put it through using those steroids. Do you think it was a wake-up call for you and some of your peers? Or unfortunately, we saw far too many continue to, to use substances that broke down their bodies and caused a lot of premature deaths with heart attacks. I had a doctor. Okay. That's why. And what was the doctor's advice? You're going to use it two months out of a year. Is that how you did it? That's the way the doctor told me. Two I, months out of a year. I've heard some very interesting stories from different guys about how they would cycle with the steroids. 
And that, that's a pretty good one from what I've heard, two months out of the year. W would you pick certain times to do it? Would Competition you do it only. Two months straight? No. How no. would you break it up? No, I didn't break it up. I'm not a doctor. No, Don't I mean, but you me. said I just said that I went by the doctor advice. The doctor told me what to do. You said you'd do it two months two out months of the year. Two months out of the year. Would you do it two consecutive months? No, you're going you're gonna to destroy your liver. So would you do it for a week? One every, month. One week a month? One month. One month? One month. Then you do take, it for one month. Take five It take a off. month. You do it for one month. It take a month for it to leave your system. Yeah. So even though you took it for one month, you're in, you, 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 uh, it's, it's two months in your system. Then you have to lay off twice the amount of time that you was on. Mm -hmm. so, if you, so if you take it for one month, it take a month for it to clean, that's two months that's yep. in your system. So you need four months to dry out. And then you'd start all over again. So it's basically a six-month cycle for you. But if you're you not competing, it. you don't take it. Right. Most guys only take it for competition only. Now, were you in WWF when you were taking, or was this before WWF, or both? If, if, if all to say to you, I'd rather for us to end this conversation. What's that now? I, I wish we could end this. You don't want to get into I don't want to talk about drugs. All right. Well, no. that's a different no. don't substance Don't want to talk about to drugs. Don't want to talk about drugs. Fair enough. Because yeah. the, the, the whole business get painted with it. Yep. Well, it was a different the, no, time. No, I mean, no, no. It's something. When you talk about drugs in today's time, yep. there's no brushing over it. There's what? You, you labor in all the wrestlers. That, that's, people do that. They broad brush all the wrestlers. I've been getting called from Vince about, shut up about that. We don't want to hear about it no more. Vince name would come into it. WWE name would come into it. One football player punch a guy. They bring all the football players. And once you, get, once you bring drug into the subject, everything we just talked about get lost. The good stuff. Nothing, they don't care about nothing else. Because everybody is looking for something to destroy somebody with. I'll ask you this. In 2010, when you went back, very, or in 2008, I'm sorry, very, very strict drug policy, the WWE. Yes. How often would you be tested to make sure that you It's were, random. It was random. It's okay. random. You don't know when it's going to happen. Several times a year? You could get seven times a day. Oh, it's random. Really? Vince do it when they want. The doctors do it when they want. They want to catch you. Yeah. So you don't know when. You can walk in any WWE dress room, hey, we need you. And that's, what, and that's what stopped all of it. Do you think it's safe to say in this generation it's a much healthier athlete in WWE? No. No, and why is that? Because the guys didn't, everybody didn't do it. See? Back in my day, there were maybe five wrestlers in the whole freaking world that did steroids. Five. But we talked like they all did it. Well, in the late 80s, it was pretty no. commonplace. By who? Well, when McMahon went to trial in 1990. Rick well, Flair okay. didn't. All your big stars We're didn't. We're talking WWF Stain in the 80s. Sting didn't do it. Yeah, but who? Randy Savage didn't. You don't think Randy Savage did no, steroids? Are then. you crazy? Not then. Tony, I never come seen on. him do it. I don't think he did. He had no muscles. He was a little bitty guy. They're your opinions. They're your he memories. You were in the locker room. I wasn't. I seen him in the locker room. He didn't look all that big to me. I know David Boy, but, you know, no, everybody, all the wrestlers didn't. But once you bring that into it, the guys that went clean get blamed too. And all we're doing now is, is staining the guys that stayed clean. I can understand that. Point That's why doing. I don't like getting too much, having a whole segment on drugs. Well, with superstar Billy Graham, it kind of is the uh, yeah, the yeah, of yeah, his yeah. But life. that's all. But 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 what but what we doing to superstar? We make him into an addict. He was. What? What else? Just that? Well, he was a great champion. Well, no, I, nobody gonna remember that. He was a great promo. Nobody, I think anyone, nobody gonna remember none of that. Well, I want you to tell me, as a man that was around superstar Billy Graham, just how great of a character he was, how hot he was at his peak before he began to fall apart. Once you bury a guy with, so like Bill Clinton, he was president for four years. But what do you remember about Bill? Monica Lewinsky, nothing else. I didn't say it. What, what, it's the world. That's what, that, that's what happened when you started talking about drugs and wrestlers. All this on Superstar, his whole life, training, working out with Arnold Schwarzenegger, becoming world champion, become insignificant. Bill Clinton did a lot for the economy, he did a lot for the country, he brought, he brought, he brought Nigeria, uh, a, a peace to Nigeria and stuff, 
Nobody remember nothing except for one thing. Does he not bring that upon himself? No, he no, that's well, not doing you that. this, Tony. No, we the one that keep throwing logs on the fire. 1992, what did that man do? He went on every news broadcast he could get himself on. He brought up every drug scandal, every sex scandal he possibly could feed to anyone that would listen to him. And I tell you this, he destroyed the wrestling business in the mid-1990s with his bullshit. Superstar Billy Graham. He was the one that instigated all of that. I don't see that all that. You don't remember that? Oh, I don't know. Well, I'll have to find you, see, you some see, YouTube links. See, see, what I did, once they kicked me out. You didn't pay much attention. Well, you would have been in WCW at that point. Yeah, I, I just try to block it out because I know if I started uh, uh, looking at it, I'm going to get angry. I there don't was watch a lot it. of lies. I, I don't watch it now. I hadn't, I hadn't well, I'm not talking about wrestling. These were, you know, CNN-type broadcasts, the Phil Donahue show, Inside Edition. You know, for several months, it was nonstop attacks against what was then WWF, and it was Billy Graham, he David Schultz, that. and Billy Jack Haynes. What's that? He done that. Billy Graham, yeah. I, I didn't know that. He accused Pat Patterson of trying to uh, have then a Then why, we, if he that bad, why are we talking about old, I don't want to talk about him there. Well, he is a significant character in the history oh. of the industry. He was one of the top superstars of your era. There were a lot of ma people that, despite what the human being did, absolutely loved the character. They still love him to this day. He had a great autobiography that was put out that was exceptional. Hmm. Well, I'm learning something now. All right, well, <laughs> I see, just that's why we have this almost like therapy know, sometimes. But I didn't know that. You didn't know that? No, no, I'm going to no. have to send you a couple links. I think you yeah, find it very interesting. Now, I'm learning something. He was, you talk about someone that was blackballed from professional wrestling. After what he did, he should be ashamed of himself. He tried to make peace after the fact, but he should be ashamed of himself. He hurt a lot of people. He cost a lot of people jobs. And if you look at the quality of the content in WWF from, say, 92 to 96, it was poor in a lot of instances. A lot of people lost their jobs with how the attendance plummeted. Hulk Hogan became the incredible shrinking man. He got off whatever he was on. WWE had to use, they had to have, you know, real, they had to institute real steroid testing. And it was the majority of the locker room that had to get off it. Everybody just shrank. In 1992, virtually every top superstar they had left the company, which led to Bret Hart getting a big push, which led to... Shawn Michaels getting a big All push. All the guys that didn't Within know. just a few months, you're talking about Hogan left, Warrior left, Roddy Piper left, Legion of Doom left, Jimmy Snooker left, uh, Kerry Von Erich left, Sid, what was he known as then? Sid Justice left. I mean, if you look at the WrestleMania 8 card, almost every top star in the company at that point was gone by the Survivor Series six months later because they had to do real testing because of the pressure put on the company by the bullshit in many ways that Billy Graham created. Was there some truths to the steroids? The, the, sure. the, last, the other the, stuff, no. The, the last time that I watched a WWF show yeah. was in 1986. Okay. I hadn't watched it since. You haven't watched it since, at that point? Yeah, 1986. Last time I can I understand that you left with a lot of hard feelings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask you this, Tony, to sum it up. For the people that are fans of superstar Billy Graham. Okay. An exceptional character. You you tell us. What well, kind of a wrestler said, was it? Well, well, I, well, I didn't, you know, uh, apart from the other stuff, you know, I thought he was a, you know. See, Superstar, back in them days, guys like Superstar Billy Graham, Ivan Puska, they didn't really have to wrestle. Superstar main thing was just going out there doing the strongman gimmick. That was the gimmick back then. You know, like I said, wrestling was like a circus. So you had your strong man. I talked to Terry Funk, and I was in the ring doing the stuff superstar do, the same stuff Ivan Puska do. He said, kid, I'm telling you something. He said, they never had a muscle man that could wrestle and fly. He said, why do you work more on your wrestling and more on your area moves? You? That was, that was he was telling me. Okay. And so I started doing leapfrogs and drop kicks, and I started wrestling. So if you notice most of my tape, you don't see me doing a lot of strongman. The only strongman thing I did was the press slam. That's the only time I showed my strength was with the mm -hmm. press slam. The rest of the time, I wrestled. But back then, if you had big arms and big muscle, you didn't have to wrestle. If you were 
three, four hundred pounds, you didn't have to take bumps. That's what made um, yeah believability, credibility. Well, well, that what made West Virginia so so popular so quick. Uh, King Kong Bundy. I wrestled King Kong Bundy when he was just starting off, just beginning. He had mm -hmm. real long hair, had a, a gimmick kind of like one man game. Yep. And they sat and watched the way he moved. So they didn't. They never showed the tape. They, they scratched the tape. It was at Allentown, Pennsylvania. They brought him back about two, three years later. They sent him away to learn how to work. And he was the main event with Hogan. Because they, Bam Bam Bigelow. You didn't have guys to wrestle like Bam Bam Bigelow in the, uh, in the earlier days. Right, right. So, so to get a big man like that, that, that could move. Move a little bit. Was unusual. To get a muscle man that could wrestle. Now, you know, you got Cena, who probably the, the biggest beast I've ever seen in my life. But he could move. Back in the older days, he would be wrestling like Puskett. You grab this arm, throw him up, grab this arm, throw him up. He was doing the same thing, Superstar. If you look at all the old matches, muscle men didn't do much. They didn't have to. They didn't and, have and to. And all right. unfinished right. move was a bye hug. Everybody used a bye hug. And what do they use it for now? A quick rest hold. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But now, now you take guys built like, built like uh, Superstar Billy Graham coming off the top rope now. Yeah. Walk, like Undertaker walking the ropes. So. The, the guys are more, I would say the guys are more athletic now than they've ever been. All right. Because they expect more out of their talent now than what they did in my day. All right. See, in my day, it was save some for later. Today, get it in now, kid. There may not be no later. You don't get it done now because, like, like I say, the world is moving fast. Don't get and it in. Get everything in. Get everything, get everything in, in that in. you could get because the next guy going to come and he's going to try to get one more thing that you didn't get. So everybody, if the world now is in such a fast pace that and I have to give WWE and Vince McMahon and Stephanie and Triple H a lot of credit. They've been keeping up. I mean, they got the number one show on television. On I try to watch TV, the yeah. number one tele the more, number one thing on cable television, and 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 and, and, and more people are going to live a lot longer because of their new policy. You got wrestlers moving into Kane just became mayor somewhere. Did somebody tell me he won a primary? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so you know uh, so they, they they got wrestlers that in movies now would never happen before. Uh, I saw the big guy Curtis. He's on Fox on on on, on Greg Gunkel show. He used to be come out and dance all the time. Brutus oh, Clay. Brutus Clay. There you go. Yeah, yep. he worked for Fox uh, yep, now. Yeah, yep. I've seen yep. him on Fox. Yeah, he's on yep. Fox now. So you know, back in the day, you know, you never expect a, a guy would go from the ring to to a major network. And he's on prime time. That's a you know, Greg Gunkel is you know he's a. That's pretty. That, that that's pretty you know, big up there. You oh, know, he's uh, not just a jabroni guy. He's, you know, we we danced away from superstar Billy Graham. But a great point is, you know, you can talk about the old days with great fondness. But there's a lot you can appreciate about what's going on in 2018. Oh, yeah. Well, the older guys like Billy Graham and Bruno Sammartino and Pedro Morelli, they they the foundation of the business. I mean, they sweat and blood. What, whatever you say about the superstar, he bled every night for the people. I mean, you see this guy forehead, look like somebody took a tractor and a cultivator. A fountain. A yeah, fountain yeah, yeah, look like, yeah, look like somebody plowed. Carlos Colon. I mean, these guys sacrificed injury, and most of the hip injury did not they mainly come from the steroid. They came from the falls and the kicks sure, and the bumps and everything. I, I, I go to these, see some of these old guys, it feel like I'm going to a nursery home. It's like the I walking dead we talked about. Yeah, I just had a hip yeah. a hip replacement. Oh wow, that's great. Yeah, I have both knees just replaced. Oh, that's wonderful. Hey, I just had my shoulder cuff work on. Oh, wonderful for you. Hey, how how my new lip loop? A new lip? You got a new lip? You know that's up there. Everything been freaking replaced on them. You know, we like to walk the walking mummies now. You well, know? The, the true walking dead yeah, 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 the yeah, legends you know. fan fest. Yeah, like nowadays. I was one guy he was saying about, yeah, you know. My, my cholesterol is down, you know, everything. I mean, any injury, anything <laughs> you could freaking name. I was talking to one wrestler when they so happy to see me. <laughs> He's got a sight. I ain't going to call his name all the way back. Freaking false teeth fell out of his mouth. Where did my teeth go? You know, that, 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 <laughs> looking for his teeth that they went on the floor somewhere, you know, because he had every tooth in his mouth knocked out. 
All right. Well, Tony, again, some very interesting discussion, even if we kind of danced away from superstar Billy Graham. I'll say this, though, fans. After what I said about superstar Billy Graham, you might not want to marry him. But if you do have that special someone in life that you are interesting and married, we want you to reach out to our good friends at KO Wedding Coordinators. Check them out. We'll be back after this brief time out to wrap up the show. Have you ever thought about just how much time it takes to plan every detail of your wedding day? Many brides are now spending 10 to 15 hours each week planning the perfect day. It's like adding a part-time job to your already busy life. Not everyone can afford to hire a full-time wedding planner to help with every detail, which is why so many brides are now turning to a wedding day coordinator. That's right, a wedding day coordinator saves you money, and more importantly, it gives you the peace of mind that your special day will run smoothly. From finalizing all of the details you've worked so hard on to coordinating with vendors, KL Wedding Coordinators will be there every step of the way to guide you through the day and allow you to savor the memories that'll last a lifetime. For more information, visit facebook.com backslash KL Wedding Coordinators or give them a call, 603-320-2752. Ready to take their rightful place amongst the literary greats. Who, 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 who? Who, you ask? The New Day! That's who. It's the Book of Booty. Shake it, love it, never be it. It's the feel-good story of the rise of the New Day. Loaded with games, trivia, coloring pages, and so much more. The Book of Booty. Shake it, love it, never be it. Available now, online, or wherever books are sold. Wrestling fans, welcome back to Memories and Legends. Tony, we've had a blast. Today, Wonderful we not, We've had a blast. We talked about Bruno San Martino. We drifted into Kuwait. We talked about superstar Billy Graham and everything in between. Before we go, we're ready to close out the show. Fans especially wanted to know our good friend Reno Chastain from down in Palm Bay, Florida. Any special memories of a man that was a champion for a big part of your WWF run? That being Mr. Bob Backlund. Yeah. Do you have any memories of Bob Backlund? None. No interactions with the man, the top guy in the company? That's... You remember that? I knew he was the top guy. I stayed in my place. You were with him 300 happy. plus days a year and you had very little interaction with Bob. If you ever watch Legend House, yeah. what made Piper, what made Hacksaw, and Jimmy Hart, Hillbilly Jim, Pat Patterson, the one thing that every, all eight of us said, this is the first time in wrestling that we got to know each other. I remember that I, was the theme of the show. That, that's right, because we see each other in the dressing room. Backlund was the champion. He come in, shake guy's hand, and he leave. He didn't travel with us. We didn't travel with Hogan. We didn't travel with Flair. Even now, you go to a WWE show, all the big wigs, they get on their bus. Me and Mark Henry, Ted Long, we get in our car. We see each other in the dressing room. We see each other in the ring. Once the lights goes up, we don't see nobody no more. Wrestlers are independent entities. So when you ask questions about people, all I could talk about is the match, my, inter, my intervene with him. Right. We could talk about the, you know the wrestler always talk about the, this match they have with this guy, this match they have with this guy, because the match is the only thing we had with them. Right. They, we are not friends. We are business associates. Did you look at Backlund as someone, as perhaps given the opportunity, you could have taken his spot. You were so hot in that same time period. Anybody that was not nice could have took it. See, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. I, I understand perfectly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, one of the things that Vince got rid of was good guys. Nobody want to see a good guy no more. What I'm saying Nobody is you were white see... hot. You were like the Goldberg of your yes. time at one point. Yes. Do you think you could have snuck into yes. that Backlund yes. squad as champion? Yes, Snooker could have done it too. Anybody that was not nice. Snooker wasn't trustworthy enough. 
I wasn't either. That's why I didn't do it. <laughs> there you go. That's the problem. <laughs> See, I'm trying to explain this. I, but, but that 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 we don't, I, nobody like nice guys. Who like who want a nice guy? You ask any girl, you want to date a nice guy to tell you no. You go to a movie. We don't pay to see good guys, the bad guys. Who always drew the money in wrestling? The bad guys, like Ric Flair, all the bad guys. We well, love... the better top heel you have, usually the better yes, things are going to go. Yeah, it it always, makes it more exciting it, for the good yeah, guy. We like a good, a good, bad, good guy. But if you look at our whole history, we make movies on Billy the Kid, Jesse James, Al Capone, Jack the Ripper, a tenor to hun, uh, anything. We don't make movies on good people. Nobody want to see good people. And Vince Jr. tried to get that through his father's head for years to put the belt on, you know. And then Backlund didn't become popular until he turned what? Heel in 94. Bad. And what a great character bad. that was. That's when they started, like, when he turned bad, they loved them. But when he was trying to play this good guy, they used to call him Heidi Dude and make fun of him and everything. He wasn't even drawing money. He had the belt. That's why they had to have a strong undercard. And what an undercard they had back right. then in that time period. Right. Absolutely. And, and so you had to create characters that is bad with an inch of goodness. All right. Not all bad, but you got to have that just a little... One redeeming quality. One little redeeming quality, and then you're a good guy. Now, bad guy don't even have that. But there's no good guys and bad guys no more. Mm -hmm. They all have sort of good, sort of bad. Well, well, everything we do now, you know, you look at, you know, not to knock none of these programs, but housewives and all this stuff, that, you know, bad girls. Yeah, that's popular, bad girls. You know, to yep. be a good girl now, who want a good girl? Nobody want a good guy, nobody want a good girl. Good is out. Quick story. I, I, I even went to the book of one time and when uh, when uh, uh what's his name? JJ and then was that? I told yep. about my Mr. USA suit I yep. had and everything. Yep. They told me to take it painted black, put some crossbone and a skull on it. They said nobody want to see the good guy no more. Wow. That's why that's why with Vince being back, it, it didn't work. The people started liking me. All right. Well, See, why do you think he put me with heels when he brought back? I was with Mark Henry. It's a yep, heel. Yep. Abraham Washington was a heel. Heel. The people liked me. They did. Got to get did. rid of it. All right, wrestling fans. We had a, some interesting topics discussed. Some memories that came up out of the blue. Very happy to have Tony with us again. We look forward to having some more great Even superstars. Though I talk all over the place. There's nothing wrong with that, Tony. You have some very interesting memories from your 40 plus year career. You know, and I'm, I'm happy to have you. You know, I think I'm getting some type of that old time stuff because I don't remember that gum thing I just told you. I hope that's not the case. You gonna give me a tape or something or transcript? So I remember. Where am I at right now? Go get your billy club. Go get your billy club. All right. Well, I don't want him to start swinging that for the Hall of Famer Tony Atlas. I'm Dan Marotti. Until we see you again, folks. You and yours. Be well. Wrestling fans, just when you thought the program was over, we got more questions from the fans, Tony, on these three great champions, Bruno San Martino, superstar Billy Graham, and Bob Backlund. We wanted to add them uh, because we had a little bit of time before SummerSlam weekend in August. We'll roll right through them. Uh, Rudy Galluccio from Twitter asked, why did Bruno hate the business in the end? Some people can't accept change. Mm -hmm. You take like uh, during the the eighteen hundreds, there was cowboys that want what they call open range. They used to have what they call open range, mm -hmm. where the cows could go wherever they want. Then you got uh, people they back in them days they call uh, uh, homesteaders. Mm -hmm. They put up the fence. Now, the cowboys, the ranchers, they didn't like that because they used to open range. Right. Every time there's a change, you're going to have opposition to change, you see. Bruno came up during the era where men's was men's, and everything was rough and tough, no acrobat, no combat, not too many gimmicks. 
more, more of a serious type wrestler. Mm -hmm. And then when Vince Jr. came along with the Daunt the Clown and Undertaker and all these different characters, that didn't fit Bruno what he see as wrestling. You know, he was he was brought up in this area where you had an Ivan Koloff that looked like a wrestler, didn't look like, you know, didn't have a big, big time gimmick. Uh, a Stan Stasiak and, and all these big, rugged guys that could move. And that's what Bruno was kind of used to for the wrestling, you see. But Vince added entertainment to it. And I don't think that Bruno really liked the entertainment part of it. It was just hard for him to come out of that time period that, that he was in. And a lot of us, we get stuck in a time period, you know, where we live it in one period. And, and, and uh, I, I try to tell the young kid, you hear a lot of old people always tell a young kid, well, in my day, well, ain't nothing I did in, in the 70s going to help a kid today. It's not the same world. Right. So Bruno wanted wrestling, like a lot of guys, where Vince's father, he didn't want these changes, you know. Uh, George Animal Steel didn't want it. There's a lot of guys did not want them changes. And Bruno felt that he was destroying the business instead of promoting the business. Fair enough. And it took him a long time to really adjust to, because he was, could have been in the Hall of Fame oh, years ago. Oh, the first ago. year they had it over. Years yep. ago, they, he, he could have been in that. But he didn't, he didn't like the wrestling they was doing. He said they're making a mockery out of his sport. And I can understand that point of that view was his, his size. That was his vitality because that wrestling what made his living. Right. And, and he was very, very dedicated to wrestling. Right. And what they did, they changed wrestling to what they call sports entertainment. Right. And he was not in the entertainment business. He saw himself as a wrestling uh, business. Yeah. All right, Tony, we got a question from Gary Toplett on Twitter. Did the success of superstar Billy Graham using the steroids lead to such a, a larger influx of other superstars taking it in the 1980s where it was pretty much widespread across the board. Was, was Billy Graham really the innovator? No. No. Who was? No. There was a lot of guys using steroids for, for, for many, many years in many sports. The reason so much emphasis went on Billy Graham is because of who he were. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like there was a lot of people that cheated on their wife, but it wasn't Bill Clinton. There was a lot of people that commit murder, but it wasn't O.J. Mm -hmm. So the bigger you are uh, in life, the more and something happened to you that, with that one particular thing, they put more focus on you. It was like he was the whooping post for every, really the steroid came into the business from football. Right. Because Superstar and, played yep. football first. A lot of people don't know he was a football player before he became a wrestler. Wasn't it most the, of the guys the back then, they, I think, yeah, most it? of yeah. the guys, they played football first, like Wahoo McDaniel, Bob Breger. Wahoo, the one that brought speed into the business. Mm -hmm. it was, it, 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 the, so the steroids came into the wrestling business from the football players. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. All right. Question from Dean Deaver on Twitter. Did it bother Bob Backlund when he'd go into the major Northeast cities that he'd be booed, almost similar to how Roman Reigns is, on Monday Night Raw in 2018. Did it bother Backlund that uh, even though he was the top baby face in the company, uh, others got a much better reaction? He, no, because Bob finally realized they had him in the wrong spot all the years. Mm -hmm. He's a heel. Look at what happened when he turned heel in 1994. He's he a heel. When well, he left there as a heel, he still has his heat. The old, I'd say the only thing that, that, that Bob is, stuck, uh, is, is uh, thinking about how come Vince is not using me? I got all this heat and Vince is not using it. How come Vince didn't pick up on that? You put him with anybody you want to turn heel, if the people dislike him, that in my day, that would have been wonderful. Most heels want to be booed. Right. That's their job to be booed. If they don't get booed, they're not over. He's over. If he was not over in some type of way, when he walked out, he, got, he would get no response. So even if you get cheering or you're getting booing, you're getting respond from the people. So in the older days, a promoter would capitalize on that. Even if they brought him back for one year. But, but that proved, if he got respond from the crowd, that's proved that he stayed markable. Maybe not as a baby face.
But they tried to push him as a baby face for many, many years. Okay. But the people did never saw him as a baby face. All right. That's why as soon as they turn him heel, you know, that, that, that's what they know him as. They don't even remember him as being champion. After Hogan, outside of uh, 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 Hogan made everybody forget about every champion WWE ever had. Right. Hogan erased them like they never existed. It was almost like it was a different company. Right. If you talk to people, they always started talking about the from Huck Earl, Hogan Earl up, the 80s and the 90s. Because Hogan was the one that brought more attention to wrestling. Wrestling was nowhere near the size it was until Hogan done that. So the only guy that stood the Huckamania was Bruno Sammartino. Nobody talked about Pedro Morales. See? It's like he never, never was there. He was world champion. Nobody remember him being world champion. Like Ric Flair, once he won the belt, nobody thought about Harley Race or the Funks or, or, or the, all the other champion. Once Flair got the belt, it was like no other person ever existed. All right. Well, as we continue to key on, Tony, this is an interesting one. Along the same thought process from Rashawn Byrne on Twitter, were Andre the Giant and Superfly Jimmy Snuka more over as baby faces than Bob Backlund in that era? Yeah. They were? Yeah. And do yeah. you think that rubbed him the wrong way as champion? No. No? No, I don't think, I don't think it bothered Bob at all, to be honest. I, I know Bob very well. They don't look at that stuff. The fans may see a wrestler one way. The wrestler look at it in one way and one way on it. The paycheck. Right. They don't look at nothing else. They not you got guys that do look at the glory, we call them glory hounds. They call we call, we call them glory hounds in a day. That you can give them anything as long as they get their hand raised, they happy with that. There were a lot of guys that would not do a job because they want the glory. Right. You know, they, they don't care about winning or losing. They, 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 I mean, I'm getting paid a lot of money as long as they get the glory of, of, of doing something. And Backler was never a glory uh, hound. Never a glory okay. hound, no. Well, we gotta... I mean, he had he came into the business with such great uh, a great resume. I mean, he won just about every amateur wrestling uh, tournament. That Fantastic they were. athlete. I mean, when you read his record, I mean, you, it's very hard to find a guy with his type of, at least go with like Dan Gable or somebody like that, you know. Yeah. I mean, he was, or, or Kurt, Kurt Hennig. Kurt Hennig is another one. You know, they got a great, great amateur wrestling, uh, not pro wrestling, but, you know, but wrestling uh, resume behind him. So, no, I think Bob was very comfortable. All right, where thing. he was. All right, Big yeah. Al Cameron asks, again, along the lines of Bob Backlund, do you think he made a bad decision in 1984 when he quit refusing to turn heel to work a championship program with Hogan when Hogan yes. was on top? Any, he left any, a lot of money on the table, I anybody, think. Anybody, anybody pass up an opportunity in life is a mistake. You can't pass up an opportunity to enhance your life without making a mistake. How can you do that? Right. This is something that was going to enhance his career. This is something that was going to improve his income. This was something that, that, that was going to uh, be part of his resume. And when you say no to it, you know, he may not, that opportunity never came again. So, of course, it was a mistake, a yeah. big, big mistake. When Brett the Hitman Hart uh, uh, sang with uh, uh, WCW and, and walked on on Vince, big mistake. When Tony Atlas missed shows and got fired, big mistake. We always make mistakes in life, you know. The, the object of it is to recognize your mistake and not blame others for the decision you made. And if he blames somebody else for that mistake, he, he's looking at the wrong person. He needs to look at the Yes, it was a big mistake for him not to do that. All right. We heard from Joe DeFrancesco on Twitter. Even though you weren't in WWF at the time, you were active in the business very much so. Do you think uh, they made a mistake as far as the company goes, taking the title off of a white hot superstar Billy Graham and putting it on Backlund just because it was kind of a long-term plan? Do you think they should have called an audible and kept the title on Graham until his sizzle simmered down a little bit? Well, do you think that led to maybe a little of the resentment towards Backlund that maybe he really wasn't a guy in? reality that should have dethroned Billy Graham. Well, see, when they put the belt on Billy, it was not as long term. He was what they call the in-between guy. Transition. But uh, he at was the same transition. time, he was the longest reigning heel champion they had for a long time. He held it for about nine months, which was 
wasn't a short one like Ivan Koloff or the Sheik or Stan Stasiak. Nine months was a respectable enough reign. Yeah, but you know. I think it turned out, you look at the results of things. Mm -hmm. It turned out the best because if Superstar had, have I got that kept the belt, sometime in, 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 it's, it's strange. There would never been a Jimmy Slipper. Mm -hmm. See, because Backlund was not that hot with the belt, other stars was able to rise. You see what I'm trying to say? Absolutely. Yep. Other people was able to rise because he needed a strong undercard. To I was there during the Backlund Earl. I rose to the top real quick. Right. Whereas if Superstar was, was there, I wouldn't have risen as quick. I opened up the doors for a lot of people. Rocky Johnson would have never been in the WWF or WWE if I had never walked out. He took my place. Slooker came in after I left. Mm -hmm. See? So there's a lot of people that, that got a rise because I left. If I had stayed, I would have had that spot. But when I gave my spot up, it was able for others to, to come in. And the same thing with Backlund. Backlund helped create a lot more stars than what Superstar. Because during that period of time, the territory was wrapped around Bruno. No Bruno, no house. Right. You have to have Bruno on the car. With, with Backlund, Vince needed more than just the champion. So because Backlund helped the WWE to, to establish more talent. So that when he was on the show, he was not the main guy. Even during the Hogan Earl, there was other stars that rising up with the Hogan Earl. Right. So what Backlund showed, taught the WWF at that time to don't wrap the territory around one person. Because when that one person, in other words, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Right. You know? And so that's why we Vince, once he got Hogan developed, he developed Randy Savage. He developed uh, 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 Paul Ondorf. He developed uh, Bob Orton. He developed Ronnie Piper. He developed other people to go along with it. So if something happened to Hogan, he was still able to, to, to show. Back in the older days, if Bruno didn't show up, they had to cancel the show. If Superstar didn't show up, they had to cancel the show. So what Backford did, in a way, things got a way of working out the way they're supposed to work out. So he was meant to be like that. If he was if like that, the business would have never transistor in building more than one star. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Last but not least, again, a Bob Backlund question from Steve Moore on Twitter. Uh, in a couple of sentences where he gets knocked so much, can you describe a few positive attributes Bob Backlund brought to the plate as WWF World Champion? Bob was, was a, a perfect champion. Didn't drink, didn't smoke, uh, loved the fans, very, very friendly. He was legitimate. Mm -hmm. He was the real deal. I mean, in real life, when nobody there could beat him anyway. Right. <laughs> I mean, who, who could beat Backlund? Nobody. Uh, he carried himself like a champion. I always see him in the three-piece suit. Even you see him now, he dressed in a suit. Very polite. He rep he gave wrestling class. Br Bruno Sammartino, very classic. Bob Backlund, very very classic. So he brought style and classic. He represent the company in many ways. No scandal. Well, correct. Yeah. He, he never caused any problem with the WWE. You didn't see him on the news from doing anything. Good family man. He didn't chase the girls. He he did his job. He was a great, great, great access. One of the greatest champions of all time. And what drowned that out? It was that the explosion of Huck Hogan. If somebody else other than Hogan had gotten that belt other than Backlund, Backlund with them would have had a run. They would have had a run for a long time. He was champion for six years, so it was a very successful run outside very of the little successful Phantom run. title change they did yeah, over in Japan yeah, that really yeah, wasn't yeah. recognized. Very but successful six years run. as champion on top was right, huge. Yeah. Right, and he was very, very respected. He was the type of guy that would go to high schools and college and work out with with with, uh, with the high school wrestling team, with the college wrestling team. He dedicated a lot of the things. But he was a very humble individual. He never bragged about himself, never boasted about himself. And, 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 and he, he was very humble. Do you think it's fair to say Bruno had his big eight-year run as champion, then another big one on top of it? Hogan for four years, and he became a mainstream celebrity. Steve Austin broke every record there is to break 
in professional wrestling when it comes to ticket sales and pay-per-view buys and TV ratings. Do you think Bob Backlund was a very underrated champion in the history of the business? Well, I wouldn't say underrated. I would say technology changed a lot. Mm -hmm. When Backlund, you went to Backlund it was the late 70s, early 80s. Back then, you didn't have the cable network you did now. You didn't have the internet. Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of things that Hogan was able to use to help promote himself that was not available to Backlund. Now, if you yeah. brought Backlund in today's time with today's technology to promote him the way that Hogan was promoted. See, Hogan came in right at the time of the internet when everything was thought of being the internet, cell phones like coming. You got to realize with Backlund, they didn't have no cell phones. Right. Absolutely not. No. There was no internet. You know, they didn't, they, all, that, all that stuff came after Backlund. Right. So it's kind of hard to judge Backlund's career uh, with the career of the rest of the day because they didn't have the, the uh, technology and the ability to promote themselves. And I'm very, very lucky because of technology. It kept me alive. Yeah, Because sure. a lot of my matches, you know, you could be seeing them now, and I could be seeing now because of technology. WWE so, Network, you're YouTube. Right. There yeah. are people that just getting to know Backlund for the first time now, you know, That's right now. Interesting point of view. Yeah, Very so, so it was, it's a lot easier to promote. The movie Backlund was champion, the way he promoted himself, he did an interview on TV, and it came on at 11 o'clock at night. They didn't have what they call, right now, Vince is on what we call prime, prime time. time. Yep. Prime time. So Vince couldn't get prime time. They wouldn't put wrestling on prime time. Wrestling didn't have that type of respect to be on prime time TV back in them day. And the only way you could promote Bob Backlund was through the magazine. That was our biggest promotion. And posters. Now Vince could save stuff out. He could Facebook, email. He could contact people in Japan, people in Mexico, people in Canada, and promote his talent there. Now how are you going to promote Bob Backlund in Mexico? Right. right. Back, in the, back in 1979, 1980. Right. You couldn't do it. So it, it's unfair to... to uh, to try to uh, look at popularity with guys that didn't have the ability, that didn't have the technology that people have today. You know, you take a girl, get on a reality show now with no talent. There's a and, lot of that. Well, you're not yeah, going to bite my tongue, be, or I'm really going to go and, and, and become <laughs> and become very very popular. Right, sure, yep. Become very very popular. Back in my day, TV was so limited that you couldn't be on it unless you had some type of talent. Right. You had to have talent to be on TV. Now you don't. All right. You just well, need a connection now. You don't as have usual, to you do a great job describing it to the folks. I, we're running out of time, Tony. It is a big SummerSlam weekend for WWE. They're taking over in Brooklyn for four ooh, nights. Ooh, 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 who do that? That's Titus O'Neil, my yeah, Tony yeah. Atlas. Oh. Uh, again, this is a, the response to these videos has been so great. This usually USA. All right, calm down. USA. Relax, relax, Tony. Usually, we're going to release one episode of Memories and Legends each pay-per-view weekend, but where it's a big one for WWE, we're releasing two. Not only this great look at Bruno, Billy Graham, and Bob Backlund, but the bonus episode that's also available over on bostonwrestling.com now. We're joined by the acclaimed Dr. David Reese, who tries to break down the mind of Tony Atlas after the, the shocking shoe abuse video was released. And we'll leave it at that. Visit bostonwrestling.com. Get some of these great DVDs we're releasing. It helps the cause. These productions, they cost us a lot of money, and we give you a lot of free content. Anything you can do to help the cause goes a long way. We want Tony with us every month to go for infinity. You have a lot of stories and experiences to share. If heaven ain't a lot like Dixie, I don't want to go. All right. If heaven ain't a lot like Dixie, I just soon stay home. All right, well, you know what? For the man that's always willing to foot the bill when he goes out to eat. Hey, I'm that's Atlas. pretty good. I'm Dan Marotti. We'll Dan see Morales. you. We'll see you next month in September on Hell in the Cell weekend. Be good. Be good. I'm Dan Marotti. And I'm John Cena Sr. Let us tell you how the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation can help raise cash for your nonprofit cause. Experience the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation live in your city throughout New England, the tri-state area, down through the Carolinas, out to our friends in the Midwest and beyond. If your nonprofit organization is looking for an interactive turnkey experience while putting the fun into fundraising, you've met the perfect tag team partner to work with. 
every step of the way. The MWF offers a variety of packages for groups of almost any size, from our live events at the Boston Garden, the Kowloon Entertainment Dining Complex, and the legendary Suffolk Downs, to high school gyms and function halls. We've presented live events everywhere and anywhere. Since 2001, the MWF's mission has been simple. Keep the kids off the streets. Under the leadership of President David Reese, we bring the superstars of yesterday, today and tomorrow, to your town. Not for a wrestling show, but an event that features action-packed in-ring wrestling, autograph, pose photo opportunities, Q&A sessions, and so much more. It's the best of sports and entertainment. The week of your event, we can add on to the endeavor with anti-bullying campaigns, library meet and greet reads, youth sport concussion seminars, and more. Our live events are fit for fans of any age from 5 to 95. This fall is part of our new Kids Club program. We offer live event experiences exclusively for the youngest of fans. On the flip side, we can produce a tailor-made event for fans of an older demographic as well. We work with you every step of the way to get the word out to fans near and far on our local television offerings and to over 50,000 fans and growing on our social media platforms. Your success is our success. If your group has had enough of candy bar and wrapping paper sales and has the energy to team with our passionate fan base, bringing the NWF experience to your community is the answer to put smiles on faces while raising cash for your cause. Contact us today to get the ball rolling for your custom-made event that you'll want to bring back year after year to your community. Don't just take it from us. Here are the folks we've teamed up with in the past. 